Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. It's now time that I would like to call this meeting to order. I'd like to welcome those of you that are participating this evening in the Board of Education meeting, those of you that are in person, and those of you that are watching the meeting via live streaming on YouTube. We would ask that anyone addressing the board to please use the microphones tonight at the podium and to identify yourselves for the record. As a reminder, the link to the meeting is on the district webpage under the Board of Education. The streaming will run through the end of the meeting, and in the event that there is a, disrup a disruption to the audio portion, I will pause the meeting until it is reestablished. If any of the board members are absent, which I don't believe there's any of us, we're all present and ready to go. I'll go ahead and do the announcement of the meeting. Dr. Romero, could you please do the announcement for me? Yes, thank you, Madam President. This meeting has been announced in accordance with the open meetings resolution and is a legally constituted meeting of the Los Angeles School Board of Education. Thank you, sir. Item number three on the agenda is Pledge of Allegiance. I have uh, Mrs. Sophia Castillo and Mr. Rohan Patel, if you'll please come forward. And uh, these two students are going to be leading us tonight in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Dr. Romero, do you want to give us some information about these students? Sure, let's introduce them. Uh, Sophia, thank you for being here tonight. Sophia Castillo is a sixth grade student at Los Lunas Elementary and currently in Ms. Freeman's class. She is the daughter of Carlos Castillo and Eileen Chavez. Her brother Anthony, who loves very much and never fights with, attends Los Lunas Middle School <laughs> as an eighth grader. <laughs> Sophia's favorite thing to do is play volleyball. When she's not on the court, she enjoys being outdoors, like riding her bike, running around with her dogs, and during the summertime, you will most likely find her in the swimming pool. Sophia also enjoys reading and listening to audiobooks while playing with Legos. When Sophia grows up, she wants to go to college and play volleyball while she studies education because she wants to eventually become a teacher. Good. <laughs> but she also wants everyone to know that Mr. Tiger is her favorite principal. <laughs> Thank you for being here tonight, Sophia. Sundance Elementary is proud to recognize uh, Rohan Patel. Rohan is a sixth grade, sixth grader in Miss Lacey Rivetta's class. Rohan is the son of Amit and Sarah Patel. Rohan was selected to represent Sundance Elementary because he is a leader who has grown with us at Sundance since preschool. Recently, Rohan took his leadership skills to, uh, uh, to the stage as he led the traditional Sundance Halloween dance for the entire school. Rohan plays quarterback for the Los Angeles Tigers football team, as well as uh, for a team who competes at the national level. Rohan says he likes football, but really just likes all sports in general because he likes to stay active. This school year, Rohan participates in the archery club, uh, kids CrossFit, and yoga. Rohan recently completed, competed in the sixth grade science fair, and he was selected to advance to the Central Regional Science and Engineering Fair. His investigation was what is the best solar panel? Rohan says that something he will remember about something that he will remember about Sundance is wanting to come to school every day. He says, "You know how in the movies the kids don't want to go to school? It's the opposite for me." <laughs> he says all his teachers at Sundance are his favorite because they have all been great. Uh, he will always be rem uh, he will always remember them and also hang out with his friends playing football. Rohan <coughs> has one goal in mind. I always try to be the best version of myself. A recent gold, uh, gold uh, renaissance recipient, Sundance Elementary is proud to introduce Rohan Patel. So right. please stand for the pose.
Thank you. We're on item four, approval of agenda. Dr. Romero, are there any changes or deletions to the agenda? Uh, Madam President, I don't have any recommended changes to the agenda. I'd recommend to approve as is. Thank you. I'll stand for a motion on the agenda. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to move that we move item number nine to just um, under item number six. So you're requesting that item number nine, public comment, become number seven, uh, right under the item number six. Right. Okay. There's been a motion to move uh, item number nine, public comment, in accordance with board policy 2.8.8, .8, public address to the board, uh, to make that item number seven, right in between the recognition of the district and approval of consent items. Can I get a second? I'll second that. I got a first uh, and a second by Mr. Bennett. Uh, any discussion on that? I have a discussion. I'm, I'm assuming, Mr. Vickers, it's only because of the conversations that will be had on item number uh, seven. Is that correct? Is that why you're doing that? Well, it's just in general. Um, uh, if the public comment involves agenda items, then we should hear it before we approve the consent agenda. So, yes. Okay. It's yeah. the only comment I have. Anybody else for discussion on the, mo uh, on the motion by Mr. Vickers? Okay, not hearing any other discussion. I will uh, approve the agenda with the uh, amended agenda moving item number nine under item six. If all those in favor would now let the, uh, we'll call for it. Starting with Mr. Hidon, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Bennett, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Vickers, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. And I also will vote yes. So we have amended the agenda to uh, move up the public <coughs> comment uh, after the recognition of the district. <coughs> Item number five on the agenda is recognitions, above and beyond recognitions. Uh, Dr. Romero, I'll invite you uh, and the principals <coughs> to talk about your recognitions this evening. All right. Well, let's go ahead and see if we can get both Joshua and Shandine to come up to the front. Awesome. Do we have? There she comes. There she comes. There. Oh, there she oh. comes. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to introduce and talk a little bit about Joshua first. Joshua, wave. So everybody sees. You. There you go. The above and beyond honoree representing Los Angeles Elementary this evening is Joshua Lopez. Josh is a fifth grader in Miss uh, Angelina Munsi's and Miss Kathy Cordova's class. Joshua's teacher reports that he attempts all his assignments and he never gives up. He will even attempt to go ahead in, in all areas where he feels confident. Joshua's strongest area is math. He has demonstrated strong skills with math, math calculations, including multi-digit addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Although math is Joshua's area of personal strength, he has a high level of engagement in other academic areas as well. Joshua displays pride in his work when he reads passages fluently, writes with more precision, and answers correctly in math. However, Joshua, Joshua will also seek additional support for difficult tasks, seeking immediate feedback to confirm understanding. Joshua has even worked with staff members to set up rigorous per, uh, personal goals in, in typing that will challenge him and help him to succeed in multiple areas of his schooling. That's awesome. Joshua is a very respectful young man and is always willing to help everyone. He advocates for not only his needs, but for the needs of others as well. Joshua has uh, provided other students with strategies and materials that have helped him to improve at tasks such as handwriting. Joshua recognizes when others have done well with tasks, giving specific praise about his peers' area of, of growth. Joshua also is also concerned with following the rules and reminds his peers <coughs> of classroom expectations. Joshua is very social. He warmly greets everyone who enters the room. He frequently asks others about events in their lives and, and has stories of his own to tell. Joshua lived with his mom, dad, older brother, and younger sister. He likes to go fishing with his dad and loves being outdoors. Joshua, Josh is a master joke teller. Mm. <laughs> 
Josh wants to be a firefighter or a plumber like his father when he grows up. Josh is proud to represent his learning community. He embodies LLE's roar attributes uh, and all, all the way around. He, all, he always has a joke to tell and will continue to go out of his way to help others. Let's go ahead and welcome Josh. <laughs> Now, I'm also really excited to introduce Shandine Finn. Sundance Elementary is excited to recognize our first above and beyond award recipient, Shandine Finn. Shandine is a kindergarten student in Ms. Janelle Hadamil's class. Shandine is the daughter of Theron and Aura Finn. Shandine was selected to represent Sundance Elementary because she is a quiet leader among all her kindergarten classmates. She is always doing what is expected, making good choices, and showing respect. Shandine's mom said that she really loves going to school and talks about it all the time. When she gets home from school, she gets out her workbook and starts practicing, ma starts practicing more. Math is her favorite subject. Shandine's teacher, Ms. Adamil, reports that she can always count on Shandine to model the best behavior. Our future at Sundance looks bright with Shandine in it. Also a recent Gold Renaissance recipient, Sundance Elementary, is proud to recognize Shandine Thin for going above and beyond every single day. Aww. Why do, yeah, why don't we get both with the principals and then you guys can get, yeah, there you go. We'll do both by themselves and then both principals, perfect. <coughs> <laughs> You're famous now. Thank you. Thank you so much. You did a great job. You did a great job. Right over here. Congratulations. Don't forget this trick around. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. And congratulations to the kiddos and their families. Thank you very much. We're on uh, agenda item number six, the recognition of the district. Uh, I need Coach Mike Baca to come on down, Coach. I'm going to ask that you use the podium. And uh, we're turning it over to you, sir. I've got a little introduction for, for them, thank Madam you. President, if I yes, may. Yes, Dr. Romero, go ahead. Um, so thank you for being here, uh, <laughs> Coach Baca. If you look around the room, we see all these uh, gentlemen with their jerseys on representing our, our wonderful community. I'm just so happy that you're here today. I would like to introduce to everyone the Los Lunas Tigers Pop Warner Football and Cheer Association. The 11 under blue team are the Southwest Pop Warner Regional Champions, recently defeating the Colorado Vikings 7 to 0 at Valencia High School. They are just one of eight teams from across the U.S. competing in the Nationals in Orlando, Florida, starting next week and the first team to represent New Mexico at the Nationals. That is a huge deal. <laughs> the nine under football team defeated Alamo City 20 to seven in Mansfield, Texas to win the regional championship and the three Pop Warner cheer teams took second place at regionals and have qualified for nationals. I would like to introduce Mike Baca, president of the Los Angeles Pop Warner Association 
and coach of the 11U Blue Team. Coach, it's all yours. If I could have uh, the 9U team and the 11U team come up here. Coaches, coaches as well. I'd like to see the coaches up here too. I'd like to apologize on behalf of our cheer team. They're practicing tonight, which is probably where our 11 you boys need to be tonight too, but uh, <laughs> we'll get them in Orlando uh, this Saturday, so trust me, we'll get them over there. <laughs> Thank you, members of the school board, Dr. Romero and cabinet. As many of you know, for the last two years, Las Unas Schools has graciously allowed Las Unas Pop Warner to use the high school stadiums for our home games. When our community had the opportunity to host the Southwest Regional Pop Warner Championships, I knew this would be a ter tremendous opportunity to showcase our beautiful village and its high school stadiums to people from other states. <coughs> In order to get this accomplished, I went directly to Dr. Romero and asked for his help. With the help of Dr. Romero, we were able to secure Valencia High School's Jaguar Stadium to host the regional championships. Having home field advantage was huge for our 11U team to secure victory. We are forever grateful to Dr. Romero and the Las Lunas schools for allowing us to use the facility. Although Pop Warner is a national organization, our Las Lunas Association consists of local board members who focus solely on the youth of Las Lunas. Therefore, we hope to continue a positive and productive relationship with Las Lunas schools by continuing to work with our student athletes, not only on the field, but inside the classroom because these are all of our athletes and they are our future. At this time, I would like to honor Las Unas Schools and Dr. Romero with an appreciation award to be presented by our nine U regional champions, our national qualifying cheer teams, and our two-time regional champions, and the first New Mexico team to qualify for Pop Warner Nationals, our 11 U Blue. there's a bunch of parents with little ones if you have to leave this would be a good time to leave and we'll take a Tina, couple of minutes Tina. to allow for that yes I'm sorry I have a question We're, yes sir yes coach hold on guys hold on you guys play Saturday morning correct correct is there any way we can follow it yes it'll be streamed live um, if you guys follow us on Facebook Las Unas Pop Warner we have the streaming information on there and I'll also um, email uh, dr. Romero Good luck, sure. and hope we sure get to thank you. recognize thank you guys you next much. month. Thank you, sir. <laughs> we'll give them a few minutes to exit the room. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Good luck, guys. Good job. Good job, Coach. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
niece's daughters on the one of the cheerleaders. Oh, really? Yeah, nice. Find all kinds of cookies. Oh, yeah. Of course, I use. I'm going to go ahead and bring the meeting back to order. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, we moved up item number nine for public comment. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go to that. There was a request to address the board this evening. Uh, I have Mr. Alan Rose, I believe. Uh, Mr. Rose, if you'll come forward, and this is your opportunity, I need you to stand at the podium and introduce yourself for the record, okay? Thank you, sir. <coughs> Hello, my name is Alan Rose. Um, I live here in Los Lunas. My four daughters attend Sundance Elementary. It was great to see uh, Sundance represented so well uh, here this evening. Um, and was that it? Was that what you needed for an introduction? <laughs> That's good. For Excellent. The That's what we needed. Thank you. Great. I uh, wanted to address the board concerning the upcoming agenda item number 14 um, regarding the uh, public comment recommendations that are being put forward. I believe this is the third reading um, that's going in tonight and you'll also be taking action. Uh, and I wanted to voice my support um, for the changes that are being proposed to allow public comment on anything that the public deems necessary to bring to the board. Um, this is my first time addressing the board here in Los Lunas. Um, and it's on this subject, but I can see uh, lots of times that would be necessary uh, that I might want to bring a comment to the board. Um, and getting it on the agenda isn't always practical or, or an easy process. And I believe that comments are a good thing. It's a, it's a way for us to inform you of things that are important to the public and that we want to have in front of you guys to consider. Um, it doesn't sway votes or anything. It just allows us to express things that are important. Um, and I believe that's a, a really good thing that would benefit the community greatly. So I strongly favor uh, approving those changes. And I just wanted to go on record uh, in support of that. And those that I've talked to are, are supportive of that as well. Um, I don't know if anyone else is going to comment on it, but I wanted to bring that to you tonight and, and let you know that we are in favor of, of approving the changes and allowing the public to comment on things that are important to them. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Rose. Moving on through the agenda, we're on item number, what would be, I guess, now eight, the approval of the consent items. So board members, you should have a copy of your consent items in front of you, and I'm just going to work off of that document. Find it. it looks like the first item up for discussion um, well, on our consent item sheet, there are several items that have been indicated would like to be up for discussion. Uh, all the board members have a copy of the consent sheet in front of them. I need a motion to approve the consent items. Madam Chair, I move that we consent the agenda with the exception of item number 13 presentation of policy first reading 6.31 state of new mexico diploma of excellence state seal of bilingualism by literacy item number 14 consideration of action for policy 2.8.8 
to 2.8.9.1, public address to the board, third reading. Item number 15, approval to untable item, tabled on October 25th to, should say to 2022 mm-hmm. meeting. Approval of resolution 2022-004, interpretation of board policy pending comprehensive policy review. Item number 16, approval of resolution 2022-004, interpretation of board policy pending comprehensive policy review. Item number 17, Approval of election boundary option. Item number 18, finance committee items. That meeting was held November 15th, 2022. Item A1, approval of reports for October 2022, schedule of checks written. And item number 18D, approval of general contract, approval of award for RFQ 2023-002 HR for purchase and disposal of used technology equipment. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. So we have a motion to approve the consent items with the uh, exceptions that have been identified by Mr. Vickers. Can I get a second? Ms. Garcia? Yes. So I'd like to second Mr. Vickers' motion. However, I would like to remove item 18D, which was my request for discussion. Uh, I had a conversation with a staff member and this will be addressed later. So I would like to second Mr. Vickers' motion to approve all of the uh, consent items with the exception of item number 13, item 14, item 15, item 16, item 17, item 18 AI. And again, excluding item 18 B. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, with the amended um, motion, Mr. Vickers, do you approve of that amendment for uh, Mr. Smith removing item 18 D? It was his item. Yes, I approve. Okay, so hearing uh, an approval of the amendment to his motion, I have a first and a second uh, to approve consent (laughs) items. I'll list them one more time for the record. Items to be discussed are going to be item number 13 for presentation of policy, a first reading, State of New Mexico, Diploma of Excellence, State Seal of Bilingualism and Biliteracy. Item number 14, consideration of action for policy 2.8.8 through 2.8.91, public address to the board, third reading. Item number 15, approval to untable an item that was tabled on October 25th, 2022, approval of a resolution 2022-4, interpretation of board policy pending comprehensive policy review. Item number 16, approval of resolution 22-4, interpretation of board policy pending comprehensive policy review and item 17, approval of election boundary option. Also would be uh, for discussion is item 18, finance committee items from the meeting held on November 15, 2022, approval of reports for October 2022 and schedule of checks written uh, for discussion. If uh, any discussion on what the motion and the second is for consent items. Not hearing any other discussion, I will call for the vote. Mr. Hedon, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Bennett, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Vickers, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Smith, how do you vote? Yes. And I also vote yes. The consent items were approved except for the items noted previously. Next, we're on item, what would be number 11, the superintendent report. Uh, Dr. Romero, we turn over this portion to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam President. First, uh, we have a number of things we're going to be talking about tonight, a lot of celebrations, but uh, this is always one of my favorites is when we get to have our student representative report come in. And uh, tonight we have Abigail Automio from Century High School. Hi, Abigail. 
So before I, I turn it over to her, let me go ahead and introduce her. Uh, Century High School is pleased to have Abigail Jaramillo as her student representative, representative this evening. Abigail started at Century in the fall of 2021. She enjoys being at CHS because the teachers are helpful, and kind, and she has made great friends. Her friends encourage her to come back to school after she had been out of school for a year and a half. In the year she, she has been at Century, she has been able to make up her credits and we'll graduate in May. Something that many people may not know about Abigail is that she is a mother of two lovely girls. Abigail feels that Century has been a very welcoming place where she is never judged and everyone has helped her. Abigail's, Abigail credits her best friend, mom, and grandma for helping her to get to school every day and, current, and encouraging her to graduate. Abigail's future career plan is to become a police officer, but wants to work for the schools while working towards that goal. That's awesome. We are proud to have Abigail represent Century High School and believe that she will continue to accomplish great things. Let's go ahead and welcome her one more time. <laughs> Abigail, what is going on at Century High School? All right, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, and Dr. Romero. Thank you for allowing me to come speak to you about Century High School. I have two sweet girls, my oldest, Claudia, and my younger one, her name is Adeline. They both stay in the school and nursery. Uh, I'm very glad they have that. <laughs> um, it helps a lot that not many schools have, you know, the nursery. <laughs> I feel very secure with the babies, that they're safe, that I'm safe in the school as well. After becoming a mom, I have realized the hard work parents have done for their children. Cooking, cleaning, and being a full-time single parent takes a lot of work and time. You know, like all the, you know, all the special stuff. <laughs> and so I'm very thankful. My family and my friends have been very supportive, including my mom, my grandma, my older sister, and my younger brother, Joseph. They're very supportive in my schooling and the children. They like to spend time all together and we get to bond all the time so <laughs> and I'm very lucky that I have all the support and love that comes from my family and the school and I'm after having my daughters I realized the importance in life is family the school has the good learning environment and while I've been at Century I've made new friends with students and teachers I've done well in my schooling and it makes it easier to stay focused when I have a good environment and teachers who are able, uh, who are able to have like help with schooling and they understand everything. And it, it's like been really great because I've been able to make different memories like with different people that I've met new and also like been able to go on to the old friendships that I, you know, I meet them again. <laughs> and so, well, we did a lot of activities that we got to make a lot of memories. We had the Spirit Week, and in which my favorite day was Dress As Your Teacher Day. <laughs> we also had Pink Day in honor of breast cancer awareness. And for this semester, we students have achieved a grand total of 215 credits, and we have three more weeks to go. I've accomplished my junior year at Century in four months, and I think they've done a really good job on helping me do that. Miss Dutchover, she's here tonight. I'm like, or I don't know, I can't see her. There she is. <laughs> well, she's a grad teacher and she's really helped me a lot. She's helped other students with the classes and everything that they need for like, just like me where I'm gonna graduate. She's helped many more. And she's also been doing fun things to like help us fundraise for our 2023 prom at Sleta Casino. And we sold, well, we sold a lot of pickles. I don't know what's up with that. I don't know. I don't like them like that. I don't know what's up with your kids. <laughs> like, it was all little kids too. <laughs> well, they enjoyed all that and the drinks and the candy. Don't worry, we're gonna give them Capri Suns, not soda, I guess. <laughs> well, we're starting a do good program, which is when students go like above and beyond, like, and they help another student or teacher like pick up their books or they just like the little things and, uh, whenever they do a good deed, like it won't even be like where they're like doing in front of the teachers, like where the teacher will catch it and they'll give them a pass for like a prize or a reward for helping someone else, which is really good to have other people encourage each other, you know, to build our schools together and our community. And mm, 
We also had an art competition and like they put like all of them around the library. I think is really cool because there, there's some a lot of artistic kids at the schools. And well, and if you win that, well, you get like a free burrito from bur burrito oils, don't they? <laughs> so it's pretty yummy. And so, well, thank you again for letting me speak to you about Century High School. Yeah, wanna... Ms. Garcia, I have a couple of comments. Yeah. So while your journey was not textbook, <laughs> it is most definitely remarkable. Because being a parent is a full-time job. And being a student is a full-time job. And we feel blessed to have a school like Century High School in our district. And I've been there, and I know the kind of teachers that work there mm -hmm. and the care that goes into uh, educating all of the students there. And we discussed this a long time ago when we were bringing Century in about how important it was to provide this opportunity for you. And I'm really glad that you get to be so close to your, to your kids every single day that you're at school. Um, at the end of the day, you're gonna graduate with a diploma from Los Unas Schools. And you're gonna have every opportunity that any other person, regardless of where they graduate from, has. And from the sounds of uh, what you said and what I read, there is nothing that's going to stop you from accomplishing any goal that you have. I just met you, and I'm very proud of you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I agree with Mike. Totally want to congratulate you for coming back and making that choice. I'm sure it was pretty hard, but I'm glad you did it. Thank you. I, I just want to say that you're, you yourself are the uh, story of Century High. I mean, we can just see the, the accomplishments you've made, and uh, you're, you're sort of the face of Century High, and really um, we're proud of you and, and what's been accomplished between you and the school. Thank you very much. When I say this, I want to make sure I say it right. <laughs> we had kids in here that we recognized. We had baseball players a couple months ago. But hearing your story, you face some challenges right away. And usually, it has to be somebody older than you to have a hero, OK? Mm -hmm. You're my hero. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, same thing, Ms. Hadamio, I just, I'm, I'm uh, uh, connected to you more than you know, and you've come a long way. You have some courage and some strength that a lot of high school students don't have. Um, just as good, just as talented, just as strong, but what you're going to bring to the community is something even greater and better. And for that, I'm so thankful that they talked to you into going back to school and that you saw the importance of getting your diploma because there's a big world out there and you're going to change it and we're very very happy to hear that and i'm very thankful for century high school and i'm very thankful for the work that the teachers and the staff do for the kids there because it's a non-traditional environment but you're learning and you're going to graduate so congratulations to you congratulations to century because this is a product of your school and this is why we're so proud of you so thank you all thanks thank you very much All right, and uh, Ms. Dr. Romero, if you want to continue. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, we've got two schools here tonight uh, that are going to be talking to us about some of the wonderful things happening in their schools. Uh, first, we have Los Angeles Elementary. Mr. Tiger, it is all yours. Board President uh, Garcia, members of the board, Superintendent Romero, thank you for the opportunity to speak about uh, Los Lunas Elementary. I just want to thank our two students who represented us so well tonight and we also have some staff members here from Los Lunas Elementary and I just want to thank them for uh, being with us tonight. I'm, my name is Eric Tiger. I'm the principal of Los Lunas Elementary. Uh, Mr. Matt Pendrack is my assistant principal and I want to apologize up front if my southern accent comes out but I especially want to apologize if his New York accent comes out. So <laughs> We didn't even notice. <laughs> 
Uh, Mr. Pendrack is going to come up and he's going to uh, tell you a little bit and share about our school and he'll uh, talk about our first slide. All right, thank you, Mr. Tiger. It's my, uh, obviously my first uh, year here in Los Lunas, moving here from, uh, from New York. And, uh, and there's a lot of things that, it, that it were different here uh, than there were in New York. And I can tell you that, that the drive for excellence here is something that is, uh, I, I just didn't see in New York. People here in Los Lunas, and especially, um, I know from working with Mr. Tiger, the staff members care very much about how well the students do. Uh, we focused more in this 90-day plan about the how of our learning targets. And the how is the portion of the learning target that focuses students on the learning in particular. So when we decide to, to really push for 50%, 67%, 85% proficiency, that is a really big on-ramp to that particular uh, goal, making sure that every student understands what they are supposed to do and how they're supposed to get there. We've also been doing a lot of observing and targeting our data trends in, in iStation and Imasa data. So when that, when that uh, formative assessment uh, information comes through, we tend to be able to take a look and coordinate it and see how the students are doing from month to month and from period to period, time to time. And we have been seeing some, as you can see from the uh, left-hand side graphic, we've been seeing some really good trends. Students who, who were struggling in the beginning of the year are now moving forward um, and, and, and moving up towards proficiency in uh, towards the uh, middle of the year. We're actually gonna be doing our middle of the year assessments next week, um, and, uh, and we're looking at some very promising data. Also, we've decided to put together uh, more time in the week for students and or for, or for teachers, for example, to to uh, plan together. Uh, we have teachers and PLC meetings uh, that uh, happen once a week, as well as vertical meetings that we meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays, depending on uh, where. Uh, or what grade level that they teach. And during those vertical meetings, they're able to take a look at how their curriculums line up with each other. You know, see where students were, were at the end of one year, where they pick them up at the end of the next, or at the beginning of the next. And it tends to work that way here and there. And, uh, and teachers begin to see some uh, defining strands that they can help reinforce with students who may need uh, interventions and with uh, pushing um, our, uh, you know, general education students forward uh, at a faster rate. Yes. Some of the things that we're looking at as far as academic improvement at Student Center is uh, we are very proud to receive uh, and become an Apple Distinguished School. Uh, I know that uh, when Ms. Martinez was up here uh, presenting from her school, I think uh, we told you at that time that we have three schools in the state of New Mexico who have received that distinction, and all three schools are here in uh, Los Lunas School District. So we are very happy to have received that. That distinction, uh, just the hard work of our students, the hard work of our staff, and uh, the support of our district uh, to make sure that our students have uh, the latest technology in order to improve their learning. Um, Mr. Pendrag mentioned earlier that one of the things that we're looking at as far as our proficiency in math and in reading is we want to try to get our students up uh, to 50% proficiency in each of those areas. And so our teachers have been working really hard uh, this semester, really pushing our students, working on rigor, um, you know, with the uh, learning targets that we have in place and the curriculum that we're using. So we are, we are starting to see some progress with our students. Uh, we do walkthroughs um, bi-weekly with our staff. Uh, one of our favorite times is to be able to go in and observe a teacher and to talk to the students and then to meet with the teachers after that and provide feedback. Uh, we also have uh, our ELTP programs going on, uh, academic, social, physical. Uh, Mr. Pendrack and I actually will be starting a uh, uh, club next spring. We're going to be doing a bike riding club. So I'm going to have to get my lungs in shape before then to keep up with those kids. So, and I did order a lot of helmets and pads my size, so I won't hurt myself. Um, as Mr. Pendrack mentioned, we do have our vertical meetings uh, that we focus on uh, data. And we've had uh, Ms. Dow and Greg Howe come in and work with us on the, um, the Cognia, the MSSA um, assessment, uh, so that we can dig a little deeper into our data. And then as far as our parent family communication goes, we uh, started a program a couple of years ago, and because of COVID, we had to uh, put it on hold, but we've brought back our Tiger Dads. 
uh, where we have dads come into our school and, and volunteer. Uh, they help us out with security. They help us out with uh, recess and lunch duty. They'll go into the classrooms and read with students. And so we, I think we have about 12 dads that have signed up for that. And we're very thankful to have them up there. The students love having them up there. They're the heroes when they show up. And so we especially love having them up there. Uh, we, uh, we have a core team that we meet with at our school with our staff. But what we wanted to do is this year have a parent core team. And we try to meet with them uh, every other month, uh, just kind of let them know the direction of our school, our goals, and to get their feedback on how we can get our families more involved and what our families need from us. We hold uh, monthly PBIS assemblies. PBIS is a positive behavior interventions and supports. And um, uh, Coach Martinez is in charge of that. And we make sure that as a staff that we're trying to recognize those positive behaviors that we see throughout our school uh, and recognize those at, at the end of each month. We've been very thankful that we've been able to bring back some of the events that we had pre-COVID with our Fall Fest, our Turkey Bingo, and we have our Courtyard of Lights uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. We ha our teachers send out uh, monthly newsletters uh, as well as we do as a school uh, to try to communicate uh, with our, with our uh, families. And then one thing that I started this year to try to find another way to reach out to our families to let them know what we do at LLE and why we do it is I started a podcast called Tigers After the Bell Podcast. Um, and so it's available on uh, Apple. It's available on Spotify. <laughs> Just kidding. It is available on that stuff. Uh, but in the future, we want to start having homework diners uh, where we can have parents come in with some of our teachers there so the teachers can work with them on how to help their students uh, with the curriculum and with homework. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the board, anybody have any questions for Mr. Yeah, I'd like Tiger. to. I like those programs going on, especially at uh, Tiger Dads. I mean, I think it's important that the dads get out there because it's always the moms that are doing it. Pretty yes. Much, so. Well, on. I've had moms ask me why I don't have a group for them, and I tell them because you're already involved. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't have to do a whole lot to get them Great involved. And, and, you know, dads are always looking for a way to help out at the school. And when we mention security, you know, that we need an extra set of eyes up there, they, they jump all over that. So we're, we're very thankful to have the dads that we have up there. Anybody else? I don't know how many followers you have on your podcast, but I'm one of them. Are you? Yes. I don't check it very often, but uh, 47 people so far. So. I like that first one because you were correcting yourself because you had said one word too many times, so you got it out of the way. That was Mr. Pendrack's fault. Yeah. He well, listened to it two minutes. He said you said episode way too many times. Way too many so. Times. Yeah. But um, again, I just think it's a it's a world we live in. It's a way to connect, and I just think that I, I love the way that you're thinking outside the box. Thank you. Um, and I really appreciate that Tiger Dads too. And I hope that it. Uh, spreads and you get a lot of popularity with that. You have so many dads uh, volunteering that you don't know what to do. And yeah. that some of the other schools might want to take up yeah. that idea because it's a great idea. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. I'm sorry, was there, I might have interrupted. Mr. Hedon, were you going to say something? Oh, oh I thought okay. you were going to say something. Mr. Garcia? Yes. So I just want to thank you for the continued work that you're doing at Los mm -hmm. Elementary and welcome you. Um, it's always been a great job over there, yeah. but I too like that you are extending this educational process outside of the bells, which yes. is which is amazing, and I'm I'm really glad that uh, to to see that, and I wish you well with that. I'm sure you're doing a great job, and I'll look up your podcast. <laughs> I don't know what to Google, but I'll, I'll find it. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Else? Thank you very much, Mr. Tiger. Thank you so much. We have Sundance Elementary here tonight. Uh, Vanessa Trigambo, the principal. What is going on over at Sundance? Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Romero, cabinet members and community. My name is Vanessa Trigambo. I am honored to be here to represent Sundance Elementary. I'm joined by our assistant principal, Edward Ramirez, who has been an outstanding addition to our team. I'd like to begin by acknowledging we had many of our phenomenal Sundance community staff and students who are here tonight. Um, will you please stand so we can give you a round of applause? <laughs> uh, 
I so appreciate your show of support and the work that you do every single day. Uh, our first slide is about changes in our practice of, to support our 90-day plan. And one of the first things that we did was back when we were creating a master schedule to include uh, large instructional blocks of in uninterrupted instructional time, which included ELA, math, and science. So in the bottom left, you can see an artifact of class discussions and learning in the form of an ancient civilization's timeline that a student is pointing to. And in the bottom right, students performing an investigation, a collaborative class science project for our Sundance Science Fair. Additionally, one of the things that we've changed in our uh, practice to support our students as part of our 90-day plan is an application of the task analysis protocol. And in this protocol, teacher teams identify rigorous tasks, analyze student work collaboratively to collectively respond to student needs towards accelerated, accelerated learning. And the purpose of this ties directly into our coaching and feedback sessions, Ms. Tregembo and I. Uh, visit each classroom twi uh, bi-monthly, once every two weeks, where we provide coaching and feedback sessions with a focus on rigor. And so we too also have a focus on learning targets. We have had professional learning uh, around this topic. We have check-ins in the form of walkthroughs. We collect data to support clear communication of learning to students through learning targets so that the students can understand or build an understanding of where am I going, where am I now, and how will I close the gap if there is one or extend uh, learning. So you can see in the top right, we were doing some professional learning around learning targets where we were uh, making sure that all of the learning target uh, components were included. And in the center picture with the two cutie little kindergarten students, they're pointing to their proficiency level of a learning target that the kindergarten teacher has altered to include visuals so that the, even the kindergarten student not reading at the beginning of the year can understand what the learning target is. We understand though that academics uh, require students at the center and in order to put our students at the center, we have to consider their social emotional learning needs. Therefore, uh, at Sundance, we have a social emotional learning task force that provides routine SEL professional development. The team actually met this summer and developed a, vis a vision and mission to continue the work of social emotional learning at Sundance. Their work includes a Padlet, which you can see in the bottom left hand corner there, which is a collection of artifacts identified by the teachers focused on CASEL's five competencies, but it's specific to each grade level. These competencies are the foundations that students need in order to be successful in their academic journey. I want to recognize we have our school counselor here, Tracy Ordonez, <laughs> and uh, several members of our SEL task force team here tonight who are proving that their work extends beyond the classroom school-wide. They just do phenomenal work that they're planning professional development for us school-wide. Uh, another opportunity for us to focus on academic improvement is through our communities of practice. So this school year we've had the opportunity to gather as a community of practice at the district level in grade level and content area teams. Uh, this occurred on the three all learner days we've had thus far. So district wide, we've been able to collaborate with fellow educators uh, for professional development and collaborative conversations with the goal of academic improvement. And at Sundance, we have several opportunities for collaborative professional learning at grade level, as a school across all grade levels, and we also have a special education team that meets to share best practices. And um, additionally, we have an ELPLC that meets to share best practices that go beyond that team um, so that they can be leaders of sharing those practices uh, with all uh, Sundance students. And so what you see in the center there is a, a class goal setting photo where uh, students are setting a goal and they're monitoring the progress of that goal. And um, that's one of the things that has come out of our communities of practice. And additionally, we have student data binders that all of our, um, all of our students have student data binders. 
and they help us next photo showing parents what we're learning and what we're doing and the artifacts of all of their evidence and the artifacts of their growth and their goal setting um, and they're able to lead student conferences through the use of that data binder our last slide is about parent family communication of goals we have a newsletter tiger tracks newsletter and within that newsletter we have pretty much everything that's going on with Las Lunas or with Sundance Elementary um, and we have uh, opportunities to invite families in so you can see in the top right corner that we have had we had a math and science night and we have the leader of that math and science night here tonight mrs. cannon she organized an event where uh, students could display their science fair projects. Rohan, who uh, shared his project at that event. Families were invited in. Explora was there so that they could participate in hands-on projects. And um, all of that information is just included within our Tiger Tracks newsletter. And additionally, we have an opportunity for parents to share information about how their child learns best and also ask any questions they may have through a monthly family focus question. Um, that's the QR code that you see in the bottom left. And this helps us just take a pulse of our community needs. That Tiger Tracks newsletter is a very powerful tool at Sundance, and it's one that we use in terms of goal sharing. Uh, we know goals are an important part of success, and so is communicating and celebrating our goals. And so through that monthly Tiger Tracks newsletter, we not only communicate our 90-day plan goals, but uh, we provide resources through articles that we personally write to our parents that opens up an avenue on how to explore the goals of the school and bring that at-home connection. We also understand that uh, in order to truly celebrate the goals, we need to do so in a way that's uh, through positive recognition. And we do that in multiple ways. The first is positive principal phone calls that happen monthly. Uh, we also have a weekly I Met a Goal. And if you look in the bottom middle picture there, you can see uh, one of our students who is celebrating not just academic goals, but any type of goal that makes a student successful at school. We also have Renaissance recognitions where families are encouraged to get involved. And you can see on the bottom right hand corner there, we want to highlight four generations of Renaissance fun at our Renaissance fun run. And then we also are able to involve families through our extended learning clubs. We have 22 clubs that we offer at Sundance Elementary. Um, and we have a lot of family involvement through that. Our teachers are able to share their special talents and we get students on board with being at school at 7.30 in the morning an hour early and staying an hour late and they love it and they're excited and their um, contributions that they've been able to make through extended learning clubs, the teachers and what they offer, I believe to be immeasurable. And in the picture there where it looks like they're at church, they are at on a field trip sponsored by our extended learning club, Science and Social Studies in Spanish, led by Mrs. Aparisi Chavez, who's sitting with us tonight. Uh, she took her Science and Social Studies in Spanish group to Los Colonias uh, Colonial Days, and they were able to have an enriching experience. So the opportunities that we've been able to provide through these extended learning clubs have really enriched their experience at Sundance. And that concludes our presentation. I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Board members, any questions on Sundance Elementary's presentation? Madam President. Yes. Can you give me some more examples of the, the learning clubs, the extended learning subjects? Yes. Subjects? So it all comes from what the teachers are able to share with our students. And so our PE coach and an avid archer lead an archery club. We have a music teacher who leads choir, but she also is a phenomenal, and I mean phenomenal, knitter. And she leads a knitting club. We have everything from science and social studies in Spanish. We have a science club. We have Lego club, which is a lot of fun for, that was the, the biggest hit this year. <laughs> um, so really just a wide range of clubs that we offer and it's all based on what our teachers bring. Our, our Lego club uh, leader is here tonight too, Miss Alicia Hawks. Um, 
their interests and bringing them to life to our students. Um, I just looked over and saw Miss Castillo, and Miss Castillo uh, leads the kids CrossFit, and she's an amazing CrossFitter, um, along with Miss Cannon. And Miss Rivera leads a storybook yoga and a community yoga class. So we have a lot of great things that we're able to offer to our students because of their special talents. And I think I missed one, and it's Miss Burt because I just saw her. She leads Girls Who Code. <laughs> And there's more, I'm sure I missed. <laughs> Anybody? No? Well, thank you, and I think that that's awesome and that uh, extended learning seems to be a hit with your school, so we thank you very much for sharing that with us. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you to Sunday. Thank you. Madam President, that last uh, uh, item I have on my superintendent report is a report on our community survey. If I could ask Dr. Elder to come on up to introduce our, our guests. Let me set the stage. Everything that we've heard here tonight, just wonderful um, outcomes, wonderful things happen in our classrooms from the moment we get students uh, through the entire day and through <coughs> after school programs. And some of the behind the scenes that not everyone sees is how much planning goes into all that, all, everything that you heard tonight. And that planning really consists of us having good information, having good data, and really talking with teachers, talking with principals, talking with the community, talking with parents, talking with our school board, uh, talking with our school leaders, to be able to gather all this information to see if we are driving down the right direction. Uh, what we did here was we asked and went out to our community to be able to give us some information that we thought that we needed to be able to make sure, one, are we spending our time, our resources, our dollars in the right direction, and also, where are we missing some things so we can make sure that we need to shift some of that energy and some of those resources to other areas. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Elder to uh, get us kicked off on um, a report we have on our community survey. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Romero. Um, we're always looking to get community input, and so having a survey this fall was a great way for us to start the year to get input on a large scale from parents and from employees on perception of current performance, as well as helping us to prioritize our initiatives. And to do so in a way that ensured confidentiality, it was important to have an external agency conduct the survey for us. And there is no better in New Mexico than Research and Polling. Um, Research and Polling is a company that has been um, in New Mexico for a very long time, very well established and very um, highly respected in our community. So we did contract with Research and Polling. Um, President Brian Sandroff is here to share the results with us this evening. But I do want you to know that just sharing the results this evening, of course, the board is the first to see the results. Um, but the results will be shared widely within our community, available on our website, and completely transparent. From here, um, our administrative team will analyze and really dive into what our community told us in the survey and help us to drive future initiatives and, and establish priorities. So with that, I welcome President Brian Sandroff from Research and Polling. Thank you. And Laura Bank, who's also coming up, <laughs> who's been instrumental in the process and wonderful to work with. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. I'm Brian Sandroff again, and Laura Bank from Research and Polling, Madam President, Board Members, uh, Dr. Romero. As uh, Dr. Elder said, we conducted a survey for you, and if we can go to the next slide uh, to briefly talk about the methods or the methodology that we used to speak, to communicate with parents and to communicate with employees. You have these meetings and I must say I've been so impressed uh, with the, the positivity of being here and how inspirational it was for me, somebody from Albuquerque who goes to school board meetings throughout the state of New Mexico and some of them are very, um, official and very uh, stodgy. And to hear the way you support the students, faculty, staff, it was very inspirational for me and, and I'm glad that I had an opportunity to see it. Another way of getting feedback besides um, having board meetings and hearing from the public 
And when you hear from the public in public comments, we've learned through experience also that you can sometimes just hear through the squeaky wheels on comments, other times also hear from people who have some very positive things to say. So there's nothing like going out there and giving all the parents all of the primary contacts of a student, whether it be parent or guardian, primary contacts, or all the employees, an opportunity to participate in the survey. And um, that's another way of doing it. And if you get a pretty good response rate, if you hear from a lot of people, you can feel somewhat confident that these results might represent um, the entire group of employees, the entire group of parents. So here the research objective, as Dr. Elder said, was to determine what parents and employees believe should be the biggest priorities for Los Lunas schools, and also uh, determine how well y'all doing um, in performing in various areas. We did an online survey. Uh, in the primary contact, you've got a pretty good database um, for, that we got from the school district. Uh, we contacted the primary contact of the parent, the guardian, also contacted the employees. You can see here on the total sample size, we actually heard back from 756 parents. Those are what we call parents only. They're parents and not employees. Uh, then we heard from uh, 370 employees, employees only. But we also heard from um, 223 people who were both parents and employees. And think about that. And within the results, the 100-page report that you'll, ha you'll get, um, we segment the results always. Here's the parent perspective. Here's the employee perspective. And here's the perspective of those people who are both parents and employees. And it's interesting to look at those results separately, too, because a person who is both a parent and an employee brings a particular perspective because they have both perspectives. And within the results, you can see them segmented that way. Um, and so really, we, we surveyed nearly 1,000 parents and nearly 600 employees, if you count the double dipping uh, uh, there. Um, also, we, we had a good uh, racial makeup, good uh, economic, socioeconomic education, level strong diversity, 57% Hispanic on the parent sample, 7% Native American, another 5% people of color uh, beyond those groups. And uh, so we had a good uh, racial ethnic diversity within the sample. Okay, so we asked job performance questions, we asked priority questions, let's get to it. Um, and on the next slide, um, basically, parents and employees were asked whether the quality of teaching provided by Los Lunas school educators has improved, declined, or stayed the same over the past five years. Here you're looking at the group of parents uh, and the group of employees only. Um, and you can see the red is uh, the parents and the blue, I think I'm colorblind, employees only. Um, a couple, there's different ways to interpret this. One way is, okay, only 14% of the parents and 34% of, of, of the employees are saying that teaching quality has improved in the last five years. And we're seeing that 29% uh, of the parents and 12% of the uh, employees say it's declined. When you look at it from a context of what's gone on in the last two and a half years with COVID, I found that only 29% of the parents and 12% of the employees saying that the quality of teaching has declined is not troublesome to me because knowing what you've been through in the last two and a half years, this will serve as a great benchmark to repeat this slide, you know, in a couple of years, a year or two, and see what kind of progress that you make. Uh, parents more likely to be critical were, were those who parents who had a kid in high school. Um, also, parents of higher socioeconomic status were more critical. But it is interesting that the employees were more complimentary of the quality of teaching and the progress uh, than the parents were. But uh, so this this is an interesting slide. On the next slide, um, the parents and employees were asked to rate how well. Los Lunas schools navigated COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic. It was a 10-point scale, with 10 being that uh, the, the district navigated COVID very well 
and the one point is uh, very poorly. So here we combined the eight, nines, and tens, navigated it well. You can see the parents, you can see the employees, and then the five, six, and sevens, which is slightly positive to midpoint, and then the navigated poorly. Now, I don't know specifically about Los Lunas schools, but I can tell from many other school districts what happened in Albuquerque, what happened in Rio Rancho, when all heck broke loose in terms of very differing opinions from parents, from employees about how to handle some of the tough things you had to over the last two and a half years. So again, when you look at it from the framework of that, the fact that 10% of the employees and 21, uh, one in 10 employees and one in five uh, parents say that the school district navigated COVID poorly. Those aren't bad numbers, frankly. Um, that, those were the one, two, threes or fours on the 10 point scale. Uh, among uh, parents, 32% said it was navigated well, 43% of the employees navigated well, and then you've got that middle group. Parents that were more likely to give high marks were parents uh, of uh, younger parents, uh, 18 to th parents who are 18 to 34, Hispanic parents, parents who have kids, uh, students in elementary school and lower socioeconomic uh, status, those were more complimentary. Okay, what about uh, on the next slide, we asked parents and employees, they were asked whether students fell behind academically during COVID. So somewhat complimentary on navigating through COVID, but do you feel that the students fell behind academically uh, during COVID? 56% of the parents, 58% of the employees, and 63% of those who are both parents and employees said yes, the students fell behind during COVID. I don't think this is a surprise to you. We've seen similar things nationally and in other parts of the state of New Mexico. Things fell behind during COVID the, and all the challenges that you faced and, and this um, acknowledges that. On the next slide, okay, we asked three questions about communications with the public. How well is the district performing in communicating with the public? Here you're seeing the results only of one of those questions. It's how parents felt the district, agree or disagree with this statement, Los Lunas Schools does a good job communicating the district's goals, plans, and progress to the public. Here we found that the public, the parents were divided. About one third agreed with this statement, about one third or 28% were neutral, and one third disagreed. Look at the other two communication statements that were read on the bottom of the slide. Los Lunas Schools is open and honest with its communication with the public, and Los Lunas Schools does a good job seeking public input to improve the education of the services it provides. The reason we're not showing the results of those two is because the results were almost identical and tried to get it down to one slide. So when it comes to how well has the district been uh, doing a good job in, in, in honesty and communications with the public? You know, you, you've had an eventful year. I expected some of these numbers, frankly, to be more people disagreeing. The fact that they weren't tells me that you're building upon a reservoir of support and that things are improving as you go. This will be a great slide to, cha to, to, to run through in a year or two again and see what kind of progress. Notice it also says in that box that the employees had similar results. So for the three communications-based questions that deal with how the district communicates with the public, people are divided. Half, a third agree, third neutral, a third disagree for all three questions and for the different populations. Okay, what about priorities? Um, Dr. Elder and staff are working with our folks, selected 13 services, um, programs, and asked the uh, parents and the employees to rate, rate how high of a priority are they on a 10 point scale, with 10 being very high priority, one being very low priority. Here you're seeing the 10s, the 9s, and the 8s. So you're seeing them ranked. This first page, there are two pages, this is tier one. These are all the services or programs where the parents are saying these are that should be your highest priorities as you think toward the future. What's number one? Improving the safety and security of the schools. 
That's what people are saying. 77% said, either rated that a 10, 9, or 8, uh, in terms of a high priority. Highest by far. Look at the 58% the in blue there. Those were the 10s. So not only did you have the highest percent, 77, saying uh, what's most important in terms of priority is safety and security, but also the 10s were the highest percent as well. What was second highest priority? Developing more career and technical education programs. Okay, that's been something that school districts throughout the um, state and nation are talking more about, more than just preparing kids for college, preparing them for career, per preparing them for technical education programs. That turned out to be the second highest priority. More instructional time for science and math. Establishing a tutoring program. More before and after school academic support programs. So notice there's two in a row there that deal with helping the kids, helping the students, either through a tutoring program or before and after uh, academic programs, and then improving school meals. So these are the slides where more than half the people said it's a high priority. Tier two is the next one, where less than half, on the next slide, um, less than half found these to be a high priority. And what are we looking at here? More instructional time for social and emotional development. But again, although it fell below 50, uh, and the 10s are much less than the 58% you saw with, 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 with security, um, there still are a lot of people who feel these are high priorities. More before and after school activities for elementary school kids, improving online options, improving, updating the school buildings. 43% said that was a high priority. This is among parents. More instructional time for fine arts and performing arts, developing a district-wide bilingual program, 41% said that's a high priority. Transportation improvements fell on the bottom. But even on the bottom, you have more than a third saying it's a high priority. Now that was among parents. We asked those same priority questions on the next slide among employees. We're not gonna show you all the results, but we're gonna show you where the employees differed from the parents. Um, we found that employees were more likely to consider the following to be higher priorities compared to the parents. Employees focused more on improving and updating the school buildings as a big issue and a high priority and developing a district-wide bilingual learning program. Also, employees were less likely to consider the following to be high priorities uh, compared to the parents more instructional time for science and math. Doesn't mean that the employees didn't think more instructional time for science and math was important, it's just that they were less likely to think it was a high priority compared to the parents. Improving school meals, uh, the employees were less focused on that as being a priority before and after school activities for elementary students and improving online options. They were less priority. Okay, couple more slides. Um, we asked, um, the parents uh, to agree or disagree on a five-point scale, with five being strongly agree, one being strongly disagree, with the following statements. Here you're seeing the agrees in the blue, the strongly and somewhat agrees, and then next to below it, the disagrees, the strongly and somewhat disagrees. So when we said ag agree or disagree, law enforcement and school research officers on campus, they increase my child's sense of safety at the schools. Agree or disagree? Well, 72% agreed, 9% disagreed. So this is consistent with what we saw earlier in prioritization, where the highest priority was the safety and security of the students. Now in this, we're asking, well, do those law enforcement officers and those SROs, do they provide any good sense of feelings and safety for my kids? And people are saying yes. The school day work, 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 the school day works well with my work schedule. 59% agreed, strongly or somewhat, whereas 15 disagree. Los Lunas Schools does a good job informing parents of their child's progress and academic needs. Okay, this is a really important question. Do you agree or disagree that Los Lunas Schools does a good job informing parents of their child's progress and academic needs. Now you remember what we saw on how well the district's doing in communicating with the public. We saw there people were equally divided between agreeing, neutral, and disagreeing. But when it came to how the district's doing in 
uh, in, uh, the parents, informing the parents of the kids' progress, the numbers were much better. 56% 50 percent agree and only 23% disagree. Um, so that's good. And I noticed in the data that um, parents of lower income households, parents of some people of, of color, um, they were more likely to agree that there are people contacting me to, to check on the academic progress uh, of my, my kids. So that, that was encouraging. Um, agree or disagree, my children are academically competitive um, with other students nationwide. Okay, that was a tough bar to, to, to set, that our, my kids are academically competitive with student, other students nationwide, but um, Dr. Elder wanted a high bar. And so what we found was 32% agree, 32% disagree. And then what about Los Lunas Schools does a good job preparing students for college uh, and for a career readiness? Okay, 25% agree, 29% disagree. So work to be done. You're making some progress, work to be done. On the next slide, you, you put a lot of resources into getting information out there to the public, uh, to the parents, to the employees. Um, so uh, we thought it'd be nice to ask whether people are using that information. So on a five-point scale, with five being I, um, I use a lot of the information that I receive from Los Lunas schools, and a one being I don't receive and use any of it, so here you're seeing the percentage of people for Remind app, for example, who say they receive a lot or quite a bit of information. 51% versus 21% saying not so much. So Remind app is a success. Uh, how do you get information about my child's, uh, excuse me, my child or children's teachers and principals? Do I get a lot of information? 45% yes, I get a lot or quite a bit from them. How about social media sites of family, friends, and neighbors? 36%, yes, I get quite a bit. Los Lunas website or other communications from the district? 34% saying, yes, I get quite a bit. Uh, friends and relatives, coworkers? 29%, uh, yes, I get quite a bit. Valencia County News Bulletin, 16%, yes, I get quite a bit. So, um, but all of these are important because if you look at the demographics, different people get information in different ways. And so, although some might be a bigger hit than others, they're all important to getting your message out there. Um, in fact, we even read people, we showed people, respondents on the next slide, uh, were shown seven items and asked to select up to three that they felt would be ways that Los Lunas school schools can improve communication with the public. And so, the respondents saw these categories and said they could choose up to three. Well, so how do you improve communications with the public? They said, well, better more communications, okay. Um, that 65% said, yes, I want more information. Give me more on the website. Give me more on Remind app. Give me more from the school district on social media. More news releases start slipping a little. Uh, but notice among the employees, it's twice as many said, I want the news uh, releases as compared to the, the parents, and so on and so forth. So hopefully this can give you some guidance as well. So to summarize the major findings um, on the next uh, three slides very quickly, um, the pandemic impact at L Los Lunas schools. Few people, Los Lunas schools, uh, few feel that the district did a poor job navigating the pandemic, while the majority have positive to mixed feelings on that. But given the impact of the pandemic has on, had on education, it's not surprising that the majority of parents and employees do feel that the students have been left behind academically. And then on the next slide, when it comes to major findings regarding priorities, we found that both parents and employees rate the safety and security of schools as the highest priority. And the vast majority of parents agree that law enforcement and SROs on campus increase feelings of safety. Uh, parents place high priority in academic programs, specifically career and technical <coughs> education. However, just one third think their children are competitive with students nationwide, and just one quarter agree that the district does a good job preparing students for college or career readiness. So work to be done there. 
And then on the final slide on major findings, communications, more to be done. 65% of parents say they want more communications. Uh, parents were divided on how well the district's doing in communicating with the public. But in that second bullet, however, half the parents agree that the district does a good job keeping them informed of their child's progress. Only 23% disagree. Word of mouth is a popular source of information for some, but the Remind app, direct communications from the district, including social media, should be utilized to enhance communications with parents and employees. So with that, uh, hits you uh, with a, a basic summary of the results. Thank you. So, uh, board members, any questions for uh, Mr. Sandro? Um, Garcia? Yes. So, Mr. Sandro, obviously there was a demographic questionnaire prior to any of the questions that were transcribed into the uh, survey. So, if they didn't answer that portion, were they still included in this? Uh, 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 Madam Chair, uh, board members, um, the demographic questions came at the end of the survey. Okay, at the end. But yeah, they, and they, sometimes they, people don't answer the demographic questions, right. so we always put them at the end so that they do everything else. And in the report, you'll see what percent said won't say to any demographic question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, obviously the, the uh, pandemic question, I mean, those graphs, I meant that's just the way that it was and the way that it is, and, and that is what it is. But given current events, do you think, in your opinion, is that the reason that security is so high on this? Had it been, you know, before uh, even the first school shooting, that would probably, I, th I think we take for granted the, the job that uh, these gentlemen do in our schools as not only a deterrent, but as actually a, a responding agency. So um, I'm sure that current events had some impact on that being so high on the parents and communities and, List. Madam President, board members, yes, I would agree with that. The last five years, six years, all these awful mass shootings that have occurred, and then some even most recently, and some of them in our backyards here, um, I think that it makes parents more alarmed, and, and employees as well. So I think uh, a, a poll is a snapshot in time, and it represents how people feel today. And so I think that the percent who, of people who are more security conscious, I mean, for the first time in my life, I'm six foot four and a big guy and I, when I even go to the shopping mall these days I'm, I'm looking over my shoulder you know I think all of us are feeling a greater sense and need for security and nothing more important than our children so yeah I think the numbers have increased in recent years and I think it's due to uh, current events I, I agree with you and um, I just wanted to thank you this is very informative and I agree a hundred percent with you in three years it'd be nice to see this again Thank you. Thank you. Members? Mr. Sandro, um, thanks for this. This really helps us. Um, on your first page, you have parents, and that's 756. And I'm just going to throw some numbers out there real quick. I, I probably will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, 8,200 students, 8,300 students we have in our district. So 756, you're probably about eight or nine percent responded, right? I well, uh, uh, Madam President, board members, member Hiron, there are some parents that have more than one kid. So um, I think that we're looking at a response rate if we look at, so if you're a primary contact for a child, you might be a primary contact for two or three children. And so when we deduped all that, uh, we looked at a response rate closer to 15% rather than 8% for when it came to the parents and a response rate of around 32% with the employees. And th these days, that's pretty good. Okay, good. And, and we look at the represent representativeness of it too. Now, I will say this, that women and mothers are more likely to put themselves down as the primary contact for a child in school. If there's a, a two uh, parents in the household, there are of course a lot of single family, uh, one parent households too. And so we did stick, we didn't want to give double credit to two 
are three adults in a household, so we, we contacted the primary contact, the person responsible primarily. And women are more likely, mothers are more likely to be primary contacts than dads. So um, although we got a nice racial representation we, on the primary context, you're going to end up with having more mothers or women. Okay. I like this. It gives us something that we can look at, um, see what we need to improve and what, what we're doing good. What can we do to make sure the next time that you do something like this, that we get more people involved? Is there anything that we can do? Um, well, Laura worked with Dr. Elder, and we did take some steps of sending out numerous reminders. Um, but we can always do better. We can put on lots of reminders on the Remind app. We can um, send out maybe a letter from the president of the school board to everybody preceding the first email reminders, urging people to fill it out. Maybe we could get... Um, a special time where employees could get an incentive or a moment, an incentive if they fill it out. There are, th there are other steps that could be taken. We'll work with you on that. Thank you. I like it. I passed the notes in here. Yeah. I'll be using it. Good. Well, that's just the summary. You got a hundred page report behind it that you'll get. <laughs> Any other members? Madam President, uh, Mr. Sandroth, um, in your experience in uh, soliciting feedback on things like this, do you get a sense that people who have complaints are more likely to go ahead and do it than people who are satisfied with how things are done? That is the age-old question. <laughs> we. Um, serve, we, we measure the performance of judges for the state Supreme Court, and we send out surveys to all the attorneys, and we ask them to evaluate the judges. And so the judges always say to us, well, if someone got a ruling that they didn't like, they're going to really criticize me, and if they got a ruling that they really liked from the lawyer, they're going to compliment me. We've seen no evidence of that. Um, and we find that there are people, what we find is the people who are just less invested, less caring, less involved with their education of their children, they're probably less likely to fill out the survey. But if you've got something good to say or bad to say, I think um, those people are more likely to fill it out. People who are engaged fill it out, whether it be positive or negative. People who probably some of the same parents that your teachers are calling all the time and try to get the parents involved, those people I think would be the ones less likely to fill it out. You're hearing from the ones who are a little more engaged. Thank you. Um, I think the only other comment I'd want to make is, is you did recommend three years from now, um, so maybe sometime uh, prior to that, uh, getting together and figuring out ways to get more people involved, I think. But three years is a good benchmark to try again. Yeah, and if you decide you want one sooner, so be it, depending on how things, um, how, how everything plays out in the district and um, growth levels, um, controversies. Um, maybe you feel that you've made some vast improvements and you want to check the pulse sooner. All those things can be taken into account, but, but two years. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sanderoff, and, and uh, for research and polling, for doing this uh, wonderful job with our information and our data. And, of course, Dr. Elder, thank you for working with them and the staff for getting us this information and breaking it down for us to where we need to move from here. Thank yes, you. and thanks to Laura, too. She worked real hard on this job. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Right. She did the work. <laughs> thank, okay, you. thank you. Thank okay. you. Dr. Romero, I think we're still in your... Thank arena. you, Madam President. That does conclude the superintendent's report, and uh, if there are no further questions, turn it back over. Any questions for Dr. Romero, gentlemen? Okay, not hearing any. Of course, uh, these items are for informational purposes.
uh, purposes only. No action is needed or warranted. We're moving now to the consent items. And, well, no, actually not the consent items. Excuse me, I misspoke. I believe we're on the discussion item number 11, requested by board member uh, Brian mm -hmm. Smith for the district organizational chart. So I'll turn it over to Mr. <coughs> Smith. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. So <clears throat> I, I guess I'm assuming we don't have Ms. Steele in here. I'm sorry, we don't have. We do not have Ms. Dale in here. Um, I guess not. Okay, because I'm calling in reference to the legal opinion that she gave on the district organizational chart where she highlighted what our board policy is as far as approving um, organizational charts, uh, what our responsibility is in doing that, and also outlining our responsibility for any changes to positions included in an already approved organizational chart that we're supposed to be doing in board policies 1.9, uh, 1 and 2. But at the end of this, she stresses that given the current set of circumstances, it is recommended that the superintendent be allowed to modify the organizational chart for the current fiscal year and any proposed changes be made in the next fiscal budget slash organizational chart approval process. And I have no idea why she's asking us to not adhere to two board policies. I mean, I, I have a hard time when we don't adhere to board policies and now we're, not, we're, now we're being asked to not adhere to two more. So my question is, why are we not approving the organizational chart? And Mr. Smith, I don't have an answer for you. I do remember the email that we did get from Mrs. Stalen with that as a recommendation or a guidance for the board. Um, I know that we had uh, a workshop available to the board members where uh, the superintendent was to provide with us his uh, organizational chart. Uh, why it's never been put on the agenda, I guess, falls on me because I'm the one that approves the agenda. However, um, Again, with Ms. Stella not being here, I'm, I can't answer your question as to why that was her advice. Um, we can put it on December's agenda, <clears throat> invite Mrs. Stella, and we can always have that conversation as a voted item in December. I, I would like to have it as a voted item in, de okay. in December. The only reason I'm, I'm saying this is our organizational chart, when I was elected to the board this second term, uh, when you talk about uh, cabinet and superintendent, our salary was a total of $586,000, which was fine. I mean, I, I think I even approved that organizational chart. But it currently sits at $833,000, which is almost $250,000 more in two years that hasn't been approved. And I just wanted to know why the board isn't approving this money, because we are responsible for it. We have a policy that says, that says we should be doing it, and we have not done it. Now, staying in my lane, I have zero problem with the changes that are trying to be made. I just want it explained. I want it explained to the public, this is why I'm making these changes. I have no problem with what you're trying to do as far as the people that you're moving somewhere. I just want everybody to understand why we're doing this, why we're adding money. And I know that there was a discussion that we're gonna save money uh, eventually if we're moving somebody up, but we're gonna backfill that director of personnel position too, I'm assuming. So if we're having a salary of 50,000 and we move somebody to 70,000, I don't understand how that saved money, but my goal is to be as transparent as possible with the organizational chart. And again, for the record, I wanna stress, I have zero problem with who you placed in those positions. That's not my, that's not my job to do that. My job is to make sure that we're fiscally responsible. And in my opinion, to be fiscally responsible, we have to have that organizational chart in front of us and it has to be explained why we're spending the money that we're spending. All approaching a million dollars a year for the salaries. And I just think that we need to be um, open with that. So I would like to, I would like at a minimum Ms. Dalen to be here so we can discuss why we're not following our board policies because it was, changed, it was voted on and now it's changed. And I don't see a problem unless any other board member has a comment of putting that on the next agenda. I don't know why Ms. Dalen isn't here. I do know that 
Um, she normally is, unless something had happened this evening that she couldn't be here. Uh, I didn't get any notice from her telling me why she couldn't be here tonight. Um, I do want to just state there was a workshop. The organizational charge was uh, discussed. It was an open workshop. There was discussion made as to why and how uh, it came to the place it was. Whether or not it's been approved over the last two times that brought that dollar amount to where it is, I can't speak to that. But um, I have no problem uh, adding that to December's agenda and hopefully having uh, Mrs. Stalen present. Uh, it would be a discussion item, or would it be a, an approval item, Mr. Smith? What are you recommending? I recommend that it be an approval item until somebody tells me that we don't have to follow our board policy or gives me a reason that I can understand why we're not doing that. And you're right, we did have a work session. We had a work session where we discussed it, but we can't vote in a work session. We have to do it here. Right, and it was never discussed to put on a meeting. Correct, and I've watched so. literally every board meeting since the last organizational chart was approved, and there has not been another one approved. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with anything. I'm saying let's follow our board policies. Okay, thank you. So noted. Any other board members want to speak to it? I do. You stated we had a workshop. We did, but not once was it discussed where we're saving money with this. Unless you guys heard it, I didn't hear it, or the methodology behind it. It, it was discussed no, at length. Can you explain to us on the methodology and how we're going to be saving money then? Because I, I didn't get it. Okay. Well, I think that the discussion was an open discussion with all of us, and if I would refer to Dr. Romero, I think it is, is because the position isn't going to be filled. So the moving up of the uh, position and then the position that was vacated is no longer going to be filled. So that's where well, I think absolutely. the savings came from, Dr. So, Romero, if you want to clarify that. Madam President. So what you, hold on. Go ahead. So we, what you heard at that workshop was they were going to move somebody up and they weren't going to fill this position. That's what you heard at the workshop. And that's where we're going to save money. And that's what you guys budgeted for in your last budget. Um, the budget didn't have any adjustments. There were no changes. So the salary portion of the budget had no changes. Um, that changing of the organizational chart would have required a separate budget adjustment vote or it to be on the agenda to adjust that budget. So that never happened because it's not necessary. There was no increase. And it happened. It was discussed in that workshop. And all of us were there. Well, I was there. I know. Yeah. I just okay. never heard where we saved the money. Okay. That's okay. the question I have, and you guys heard it. I didn't. Okay. Did anybody else hear that? How the, that methodology was going to work? Board members. Yeah, my understanding we were supposed to save money by making the move from the seventy down to fifty, right? If I'm not mistaken. Madam President, members of the board, so we had a position in uh, our personnel office, which was a coordinator position. When you look at that coordinator position with salaries and benefits, it's going to be somewhere in the range of seventy, seventy-five thousand uh, dollars. That position is not is not being filled, so that would be a net savings. Now, the the move we have from the director moving to a cabinet position is about I'm going to say you know in that twenty-five thousand dollar range more. So seventy-five thousand dollars, twenty-five thousand, that's a fifty thousand net savings. Simple as that. So it's 25000 added to the current salary minus the 70000 That's how it actually would work. Say that again. Uh, you're paying somebody. You're going to give them a $25,000 raise. You're not going to fill a $70,000 position. That math doesn't save money. It absolutely saves money. I, I don't understand how. But, but you know what? That's not even my point. My point is is that we need to do this in public. We need to be transparent. So, so my answer to that is that was done in public. We went through this budget process all through the spring. This was approved by the, by the board. And me talking to you about the organizational chart is me reporting out based on what was discussed in the budget meetings. And, and so when I'm being told that I'm not following board policy, I don't agree with that because I am following board policy. Went through the entire process with the board. The board approved that. Now I'm reporting out what that is. That, and uh, the math does work. It's so the board so, so the board approved the current budget on May 10th. There was a special meeting. It was a special meeting to approve the budget on May 10th. I believe that date is correct. 
and we were in attendance, placed back on the board at the very next meeting. So when I watched that meeting throughout the budget presentation, I never saw anything about an organizational chart. In fact, the, or the organizational chart was approved on August 11th, or I'm sorry, August 25th, I believe, of 2020, 2021 was when the organizational chart was approved. And it looks nothing like this one that we have. So the organ when you look at board policy, when it talks about the organization, it talks about the organization of the district. And the wording in that policy states about what classrooms are going to look like. Regular classrooms, special classrooms, bilingual classrooms, that's all part of the board discussion. When it talks about organization, it's of the district, and that's part of the discussion too. Part of that is what central office looks like. This was all discussed then. Uh, and what happened in between was we made an adjustment on a person that's going to save money. So I'm, never, I'm not asking for more to, for the budget to be increased. That didn't happen. There was increases, and you mentioned the number, in, you know, the increases in salaries. Well, there was increases in salaries because that was done legislatively. So there's that that is a natural progression as you go from year one to year two to year three, and that'll happen again next year too. Por portions of it, you are correct, were done uh, legislatively. I believe it totaled 7%, right? It's three and four? I it believe was, that's uh, how it went? Legislatively, 10% was, uh, was, was mandated, uh, and, but we were able to do much more than that across the entire board. Okay, so again, I'm gonna stress, has nothing to do with the personnel. I really believe that the new position being filled by somebody, zero problem, I think that would, that's a tremendous fit. No problem with that. My problem is, is we're supposed to approve it publicly, and it's supposed to be explained why we're making the change to the organizational chart. That's all I want. That's all I want to know, or somebody to explain to me why we're not doing it. Well, I would think that uh, Mrs. Stalin's memo is probably why we, at this point, haven't done it. She's not present to respond as to why she feels it isn't necessary the board do it. And then I just want to also go out there and say that there's a probably a lot of policies, which is why that's another topic coming up here in a little bit, that there's a, a proposal for a resolution that's gonna help us incorporate some policies that we're not dealing with, policies that are outdated, policies that uh, perhaps we've fallen by the wayside on. So, you know, I would venture to say there's more than that policy that maybe we have skipped up on that need to be looked at. We're in the middle of a policy, uh, uh, a upheaval of what we have and what we're going to be doing so like I said Mrs. Stalin is not here I remember the conversations and I think that it was her recommendation to this board that we be made aware of the organizational chart but it not necessarily be something we need to approve if it had no budget implications on us and our job is the budget then we don't need to necessarily approve the chart we get the report we hear why, we hear the how comes, but if it doesn't change the budget at the end of the day, it may not be an approval needed. Even if our policy calls for it, I think that was her recommendation. So she's not here to answer to that, but that's exactly. what I'm thinking it is. She's not here to answer why she said we think you should just let Well, it was an opinion she, she gave us yeah, so as I, a full board. Okay, so I, I guess we're uh, in consensus that we should have it on the next meeting uh, and have Ms. Daly present. All right. Okay. And like I said, I do not know why she's not here tonight. I was not uh, made aware of her absence. So um, hopefully she could be here in December without any uh, problem for our next meeting. I don't see why she wouldn't be here. Right. And when you mention what we're going to talk about next, when you're mentioning board policies that take forever to do, uh, obviously, it, if, if, if you paid attention for the last five meetings, you see that it takes forever to do one policy. And um, also at this uh, August meeting, uh, I believe, Mr. Bennett, you pointed out that uh, how slow the previous board was at uh, viewing these policies. You pointed that out. In fact, you made a couple of statements about the previous board. But there is a reason why we have these board policies, and there's a reason that we need to update them, and that's why we are, have already voted to go to a new service. But is it gonna take some time? depends on the board members how long it's going to take. We're trying to change one policy and it's taken us half a year. So that's, that's, where, that's where I stand on that. So in your, in, your, in your question as to why it takes so long, 
This is why. But yeah, I'm, I'm done with this conversation, my portion of the conversation, as long as it gets on the next agenda. So noted. Thank you. Any other discussion on that item? Okay, not hearing any, I'm gonna to move to item number 12, discussion of item uh, requested by member David Vickers for the update regarding the policy committee. Mr. Vickers, I'll turn it over to you. Well, I, I just wanted to, since we have established a committee to work with uh, John Kennedy regarding the entire policy manual and revising it, updating it. I just wanted to, whenever there has been a meeting of that committee, I'd be interested in hearing what it transpired and what progress was made. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. Um, as uh, Mr. Vickers has stated, we have established a committee, uh, an ad hoc committee for the policies that are gonna be reviewed by um, the agency that's gonna be working with us to help us with all that. And um, I did ask Dr. Romero that this become part of our monthly agenda so that every <coughs> month we will talk about what the, uh, any updates that perhaps the policy committee has. And if there's any, always to leave a room for voting and starting the process of changing. But I wanna turn it over to Mr. Smith because he chairs the board and I don't know if there's been a meeting. So go ahead, Mr. So Smith. So no, there has not. Uh, and to, to answer your question, Mr. Vickers, and I'm gonna be as thorough as I can, because I think you deserve that. Um, at our previous meeting, uh, you had asked Mr. O Dr. Romero to provide a list of possible people that were interested in being on the uh, policy committee. So I received a list of three people and I made uh, I voiced some concerns as to why these three people to you. And you told me that these were the people that you wanted on this policy committee and they were approved by you. The people, the pol this policy committee was approved by you. And in the previous meeting, I don't remember the board authorizing anybody to approve any committee. What I was to understand was we were gonna get a list of possible interested people, staff members, community members, parents, whoever, whoever wanted to do this. And when I got this list, I was told, well, nobody else wanted to do it, and that's fine. I mean, if nobody wants to sit on a committee with Brian Smith, that's fine, I get it. But you know what, I can promise you this, we're gonna do a good job, whoever sits on this committee. So all I asked was, can you forward me the emails you sent out asking for people to be on this committee? And I was told there weren't any emails sent out. Did I want one sent out? So how are we supposed to get a list of people interested in helping us do policies that at its core affect our students and our parents and our staff and our school community? And it's imperative that we do this we put aside everything and we do this with due diligence to make sure that we, we create a policy committee and we create policies that benefit their educational process to the utmost extent that we possibly can with, with putting everything else aside. Now, if this, is the if this is the policy committee, I have zero problem with that. I'm not intimidated. I'm not deterred. I'm not anything. It means that much to me. But I'm asking, why are we not asking people there was a community member that was referenced, hey, this will be a good fit for the policy committee, but he's already on committees. Why can't we have somebody else from the community be on a committee? Why can't we have, I talked to other boards that are adopting these policies, and let me tell you why I'm bringing this up. They're doing it a little bit different than we are, but I didn't want to change the committee by myself because it's not right for me to do that. It's not ethical for me to decide for the board. So what they do is they have two board members, so you get two opinions, but you don't have a quorum. You have the head of personnel, because a lot of our policies deal with personnel, a ton of them do. And you have the superintendent. And the public is invited to attend, because there may be policies if we were, and again, I'll use the same example I always do, dress code. If, you're, if your child goes to a school where there's a dress code, and you want that policy changed, you can come voice your opinion. 
if your child goes to a school that doesn't have a dress code and you want a dress code, you can come voice that opinion when we start talking about those policies. But it is, to me, it's imperative that we have a policy committee that is absolutely geared towards doing the very best job that we can. And I want to ensure that. And if this is the policy committee, then I'll do that. I have zero problem with it. But I just wanted to know why we did not ask people if they were interested. Because I do have people that are interested. I don't want 50 people on this policy committee because then we'd never get it done. And I talked to Mr. Kennedy tonight. Um, I anticipate that we can get them digitally, so what I would like to do is get two sets of policies, whatever those are gonna look like. But it would be overwhelming for me to have to do all of those. I think another board member would be beneficial on that committee. I think that um, the superintendent would be beneficial on that committee. And I think a director or somebody from the personnel office would be beneficial on that committee. And that's where we should start and include the public and include parents and include whoever else wants to attend. But let's find out who does. Because as Mr. Sandroff stated, the ones that reply are the ones that want to be engaged. So let's give them that opportunity. If they don't want to be on the committee, they're not going to volunteer for it. But if they volunteer for it, that means they really want to be on the committee and they really want to do the right thing. That's my opinion on what this committee should be like. But this board is going to decide what that committee looks like. I'm not. I'm not going to do that by myself. If you guys say, Mr. Smith, we're going to put this to a vote, and you're on the committee with the people that uh, uh, Dr. Romero, the list Dr. Romero provided, I'll do it. And I'll do, a, I'll do a hell of a job. But I have to make sure that we're doing it to the best of our abilities. So that's my take and my update to you, Mr. Vickers on where this policy committee sits. So I'm anticipating asking, asking Mr. Kennedy for two sets at a time. It's a lot of work. It's gonna be a lot of work. But uh, 72 <coughs> out of 80 some districts are doing it, so it's gotta be good. It's got, it, we, 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 we're gonna put a lot of trust in these, in these gentlemen. So <coughs> does that suffice for an update? Uh, sure. A little more than you needed, did it? Okay. Uh, Madam President, Mr. Yes. Speakers, if, if I may, uh, I was I was asked to be able to give some recommendations for this committee. Uh, in that, through the discussion, we talked about having somebody from the, the cabinet, that was one. We had somebody from a director position, that was another one. We talked about somebody that represents classified and certified staff, and we looked at somebody that was a parent. And so in my recommendations, we have somebody from cabinet, uh, we have somebody, uh, director, and really my thought there was, uh, let's have somebody that knows the district, knows history of the district, but also can represent students, especially vulnerable population students, so that's somebody who has special education um, experience. Uh, it was very natural to be able to invite somebody from our union to be able to be a part of that. They represent both the uh, classified and certified staff. And I really have had one consistent conversation with the parent over the last couple of years, really, uh, about policy, and what's interesting about it is that sometimes we don't always agree about it, but I, I, I valued um, what he could bring to the table. That was just my recommendations. I would, I would suggest that the board has any other recommendations to, to, to move forward and, and give it to the president. I, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to that at all. And if I could just chime in on that real quick, that's what we left the last meeting as guidance for us was that I asked the Dr. Romero do that. He did do that. I was uh, appointing uh, board member Smith so that he could chair it. I have no opposition to a second board member being placed on that committee and I agree it's a lot of work. So um, we can always discuss that tonight and, and put another board member there. Um, and then the next topic would be if any other board member has somebody they would like to submit a name to um, then again, that that's uh, totally acceptable and I'd have no problem pointing another one or four other people to the committee. I think the issue here is that, like you said, they're up and ready to work. They're gonna do what we need them to have done. It is gonna be some time consuming. And the only other facet that I think could matter is depending on the policies that are being reviewed, 
if it was transportation, I had told Dr. O'Meara, well, maybe the transportation director should be involved during those sets of hearings. If we're talking about student nutrition, I think that perhaps that uh, uh, director should be available and present for those policy uh, discussions as well. So that person uh, would be another member. Um, I don't name them individually. Uh, I just figured they would be invited to the table once those policies are starting to be discussed. So um, again, I think at this stage, I can appoint another board member or if somebody wants to step up. And then the next uh, uh, suggestion would be if I think board members want to give me a name, I would ask you to submit a name as quickly as possible, perhaps maybe by the end of this week so that Dr. Romero could reach out and we can see if they even want to be on the committee. And if you have a phone number or contact information, that's definitely needed. Too many people slow it down sometimes too. So we want to be a working committee that can get the job done. So uh, again, as the chair of the board, I think I have the authority to appoint a committee. Uh, I did, and that was the decision I made. So this is the board you're gonna work with. We'll add whoever the committee or board members wanna do and we can also add another board member. So I'll leave it up to a board member to volunteer, otherwise I'll start a board I, So I have another comment as far as, I, I don't think we have anywhere written that, that we, have, we have it written about the finance and the, and the, uh, and the audit committee. We don't have it, have it written about our um, policy committee because we've never had one okay. as far as appointments go. Okay. But I would like to make a recommendation for a board member if, if he's willing to do it, and I, that would be uh, Mr. Vickers. I think that would be the I like it. What do you think, Friends. Mr. Vickers? That would be neutral, I think. <laughs> In the grand scheme of things, I believe that uh, I, I believe that Mr. Vickers would be would do a good job at it. I think we could work together on this committee. Um, I hope that we don't agree on everything. I hope that community uh, committee members don't agree on everything. I think it's important that we get it right, but I think it's important that we re rely heavily on what's being presented to us because it works throughout the state, as I said, for 80, 80 or 70, 75 out of 80 some districts. So we rely heavily on their recommendations and we just look for any item that we may need to tailor for the Los Angeles School District. Other than that, I believe that those policies are going to work out well for us because they work out well for everybody else. So there'll just be a few that we have to tailor. Other than that, but I would like to re recommend that uh, if Mr. Vickers has no objections for him to serve on that committee and uh, we can set up the first meeting, uh, I can call Mr. Vickers, we can set up the first meeting with the individuals that um, Dr. Romero provided and with the one individual that uh, approached me that wanted to be on the committee and if Mr. Vickers has somebody and if any of the board members say, hey, I think, I think this person would be good for it too. I have zero problem with that. Um, I just want to make sure that we're doing it right. It's it's far too important to not to not put our best foot forward. Um, so that being said, I guess that's that's where we stand. So I think right now, Mr. Vickers, the ball is in your court um, <laughs> to accept that. Um, and again, no pressure, but do you have an answer? I will reluctantly accept that, not because I don't think it's an important job, but because my time constraints, but I will do my best to make sure I can turn it in. Okay. Uh, the suggestions that came from the superintendent and from Mr. Smith, I think you know we need to look at that and come to some kind of agreement on who we need on the committee. Mm -hmm. So, and, and what you said, when, when we're dealing with a certain topic, that we need to invite the people that are hands-on in that in that area of the district to be part of those discussions during that period of time, of course. They're living within the rules that they're setting. Okay. I, I agree with the subject matter expert, but ultimately we are responsible for those policies, every last one of them, right. the five ones. So. Okay, so then I'm hearing uh, Mr. Vickers, uh, yes, to be um, a second seat on the ad hoc committee for the policy uh, committee. And I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. So I didn't have to appoint. And then, uh, or pleasant, 
ask. Yes, this one you accepted. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I will just ask that both board members work out a schedule that works for both of you. Um, I know it's the holidays. I know December's coming up. we got to get it started and moving, maybe a very initial meeting uh, next month, and then maybe start the hard work soon after that. Um, so I, again, have uh, it decided that it will be on every monthly agenda we have from here on out for some type of report to the board, how it's moving, and then, of course, an uh, action item whenever the time starts coming. So, and just, so I've reached out to a couple of people that are in this process, so I see how they're doing it, and, and, it, and it makes sense, but this weekend we have a golden opportunity to find other people that are either doing it right now or have already done it. And um, I will seek them out, and that will be a resource on some of the lessons learned that we can bring to our committee, so we'll, it'll take us less time. So I, I'm presuming Mr. Kennedy can give you a list of who's completed the process? Or so I, uh, yes, I've already talked to, uh, actually Belen's in the middle of it right now as well. So they're doing it. But yeah, I can, I'll ask Mr. Kennedy for those who have recently completed it. Uh, like I said, you can almost ask any board because 75 of them have done it. But we'll find the ones that have recently done it and we'll, I'll, I'll work this weekend to get good information on, on lessons learned and we'll, we'll streamline our process. Okay. Madam President, if I may, just uh, one request is as, as the committee uh, kind of solidifies a schedule of when to meet, if uh, you could get that information to, to my office as soon as possible just so we can share it with the public and, and, uh, and uh, let everyone know about that. Okay. And those would be open meetings? Um, that the I, public can attend those I, workshops as we're working on them, correct, Mr. Smith? That's what I visualize that? I, I have zero problem with it. I, I, think I that's invite them to come over here and, 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 uh, yes. and be a part of it, but, right. you know, quantity is time. So. Right. But so yeah, I think it, can, so it should we'll be published, and I think it's important sure. that, that we get uh, that put out there as part of our information. Yeah, we won't need an agenda or anything like that, but we'll, we can. Announce a meeting. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I, I'll get you a schedule as soon as I, as soon as we come up with one. Any other discussion on item number 12? Did that answer your questions, Mr. Griffith? Yes. Okay. Any other discussion? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Gidon. Dave, I know sometimes you, you and I appear to be polar opposites, but when, I can, when it comes to doing something the right way you do it, I can always count on you. So I'm glad you're on this committee. Um, I hope you and Brian right away can uh, maybe set this policy for your, uh, for your committee and put some teeth behind it so you guys can get it going. Because people are always critical on the board when they see policies that are a few years old, okay? And I have total confidence that you two will get it going and get, I mean, we'll update our policies. It takes work and it takes effort. So, and I know you guys will do it. So if you guys need any help or have any questions, maybe something you guys stop on something, give me, I mean, I'll be there to help you because I know how much time it's gonna take. So I wish you both of you guys the best of luck. Okay, with no other discussion, then we're going to go ahead and move on to item number 13, uh, presentation of a policy, first reading, number 6.31, State of New Mexico, <coughs> Diploma of Excellence, State Seal of Bilingualism and Biliteracy. Um, is this yours, Dr. Omar? Yes, yes. Go thank ahead, you, Madam President. Um, I, I want to thank the board for you know, allowing me to bring this tonight. This, uh, and we just had a conversation about um, us being able to go through all of our policies to update them. This is one that we haven't been able to quite take advantage of in Los Lunas, and there's a little bit of timeliness to it too, so I appreciate you allowing me to have this on the agenda for the first read. Uh, to put this in context is, uh, we have never been able to graduate a high school student with a bioliteracy seal. And what that means is that on their diploma when they graduate high school, they have a seal on there that says that they are proficient in reading, writing, and speaking a second language. And uh, we have been working hard to be able to develop our bilingual programs over the last year. And, uh, and this is gonna be both at the elementary, middle, and high school um, sites. But we have the possibility of actually having um, maybe more than one student that has uh, the ability to be able to graduate this year, possibly, with a biliteracy seal. So to do that, we have to be able to put our applications in place with the state and allow them and announce that we're doing that. And one of the requirements is that we have a policy. And our uh, application is due in February. So the timeline hopefully would work out 
that we've got tonight, which is November. We've got December board meeting and the January board meeting, so we'll be able to meet the deadlines for the application in February. But to uh, to to continue uh, discussing this, I wanted to invite Ms. Trotten up, talk to us a little bit about what's in this policy. And again, this is just a first read, so this would allow you to take this home and kind of look through it and give us some feedback as we get to the second read and the third read. Good evening, Board President Garcia, members of the board, um, Dr. Romero, members of the public, thank you for allowing me to speak just briefly on this. We did go over it just a bit on the, our board work session um, last month, but um, for the benefit of everyone, I just wanted to say a few words. This is an opportunity given to us by the state of New Mexico for students who um, earn their diploma to also receive a seal um, basically certifying that they have proven themselves in a language also other than English. There are three ways or three components uh, they need to pass at least two out of the three components to be able to earn the seal, there, or there's three ways to do that. Um, the first is to have four years of a foreign language. Um, the second is to be proficient on a state-approved language test, such as um, the AP exam, or um, they have the Avant, which is um, something that is supported by the state of New Mexico. Um, number three is if, for example, we currently don't have four years of one single uh, foreign language, then they can also go through an alternative process portfolio, which consists of a panel discussion and interview. There also is a different pathway for our Native American students. And what that means is that the, the tribe themselves develop criteria um, for students to be able to be certified proficient in that native language. And uh, we do uh, speak with educational leaders at um, Isleta on a monthly basis, so that is something that um, they are working on and we hope to offer our, our native students as well. Um, as Dr. Romero said, uh, we do have uh, teachers who have stepped up and said, you know, we have a student or two who we really think can um, accomplish this this spring. So we are asking for your support and kind of expedite. Well, there was some talk about, you know, we're going through all of the policies. Do we really want to do this now? And it's like, just like you said, policies take time. And this is one that we're just asking, can we please expedite this um, and not wait till we do all of the, the policies um, because it's something really important and I think all of you would support that and, and being able to give our seniors the opportunity this spring. Any questions? Thank you. Board members. Ms. Garcia. So, uh, Ms. Trodden, so I'm familiar with this I don't know, deal to get this on. And I know it's a huge deal to get this yes. seal on your, uh, on your graduation certificate, however, on your diploma. But I, I want to reiterate the three readings thing. It's a local thing. Okay. We do that. It's not required. It's the timeline is February. I, I will make a recommendation to the board when we get to the end of this meeting that, uh, we suspend board policy 2.9 and we pass this. I was told when I left Thank home you. tonight that this better go through. And this <laughs> is that important. It's a big Thank deal. You. So uh, I, I agree. We, we need to get this done by you, February. It's got to be done. Yeah, the application, the correct. Done. Yeah, I don't think that we should that we should even chance it. So when we Thank get you. to that point, I support this 100%. And at the end of this meeting. I'll, I'll, I'll see if we can get enough support to get this done uh, next meeting. Thank you so much. Any other board members? I agree. Okay. Are we on discussion of the, or what are we, where are we? Um, yeah, on the. Uh, <coughs> so yeah. this is item 13, presentation mm -hmm. and policy. It's a presentation, this would be the first read. What's been proposed to us or in front of us today is a brand new policy. No changes from an old policy because this doesn't no. exist. So the verbiage that we are considering today is the policy that's in our, our paperwork. I do want to add one one thing real quick. Sorry, um, the wordage, the wording in the the proposed policy is almost verbatim from the statute, and um, the reason that we did that is because, for example. Um, 
assessments by name, the PED can change at any time. We don't want to be so specific um, that we'd have to keep coming back and asking for you to re repass a new version of this policy. So it is very close to what is in statute. So um, we are compliant and yet just loose enough that we can account for maybe any minute changes that the PED may have. And to follow up on that, if the legislative uh, statute changes, then we need to. Yes. But we would not need to if PED changes their requirements. Correct. And Madam President, uh, members of the board, Elena, we did already have this ready to get our you know opinions that make sure that the language was appropriate from our, our legal uh, counsel. So uh, we've been able to do that work too, just to give you that information. Thank you. Oh, okay, Madam President, then uh, with that, with you still there at the microphone, uh, it seems to me that we need to um, add some language to this policy. And uh, the policy, it's very rigorous. I, you know, I could never pass basic Spanish, so what can I say? But it's very rigorous. Yes. But uh, on the second page, in uh, paragraph 4B, just for instance, um, it says the student must create a portfolio comprised of the following of a presentation, an interview with a panel, composed of three or more members of the district's education staff and community who are proficient in the target language. Correct. So, well, number one, we only teach Spanish at Los Lunas High School. Correct. No other language. So I'm just thinking, if you have, for instance, a Ukrainian refugee that is in our district who speaks fluent Ukrainian and would like that stamp, um, exactly who is going to be on this committee to, to evaluate them? I agree with you, and it is very stringent. We would, we would have to find uh, members and, and perhaps get it approved by um, PED. Unfortunately, that is word for word what is in statute. So I don't see a, a way around that wording. Um, but I agree with you. It's something that I've definitely thought of. Um, you know, it says uh, a combination of district personnel and um, community members. I think there's probably community <coughs> members out there that uh, we could find to speak several different languages um, or who are fluent in several different languages. Um, in district, that is very much uh, harder to come by. We definitely have to do a survey first and see, you know, maybe there's somebody, for example, in, um, that works for us that is fluent in German and we've never asked that question before. Um, so those are, those are things that we would have to go out and, and find first um, and then advocate at the state level. Um, but I don't see how we could, at this point, get around that language because that is what is in the statute. Madam President, members of the board, just to add to that answer, um, we do have a lot of resources around New Mexico. So in the example of like a Ukrainian speaking student, um, right, we may not have a staff member that, that speaks Ukrainian. Um, what we do have on staff are experts in learning second languages. So that'd be one side of it. We have experts on how they are able to uh, develop curriculum to help them learn English as a second language. That helps them get proficient in English. But we are also able to work with, and we have some great, uh, just because of where we're at uh, regionally, we can work with our high, higher ed institutions. And UNM is going to have uh, staff members that do, you know, somebody that speaks Ukrainian, likely. And so we will reach out and try to find those community members out there or those partners to be able to help us do this. Uh, we, we've run, I've, in, in the past, I've run into examples like that before. If we put our heads together a little bit, we always find a solution to it. And again, I think in our digital age, again, we have some, um, maybe some resources that we didn't have in the past, where maybe there's um, somebody that, if it's really a language that we're unable to find, that we could find maybe that could join us via, via Zoom or something like that, that don't have to be physically present to take part in the panel. Okay, so I agree with all of that, that there are experts around, we can find them. But it seems to me the policy needs to say something about, in the absence of staff members, or even community members in Los Lunas uh, who are proficient in the given language, we will reach out and find other people 
through the university system or whatever that can determine if the student is indeed fluent. Can we put some kind of language that says that in here? I think that's fair, that we could find wording to add to that. Because, you know, it says it's got to be comprised of three or more members of the district's education staff and community. Well, if we went outside of that, then we'd be violating this policy unless we had some provision for a what if. So for a second reading or final reading in December, I'd like to see if we can put that in there. And, and present company accepted. I, I don't like the legislature developing school board policy. You know, really it should be the school board doing yeah. it. So. Well, I think it, we're required to follow at the very minimum the state statute. Yes. So I think for us as a district, if we were to add in maybe not a, another item B, uh, tab in and go to a B1, what you would be proposing to do what in the what-if scenario um, that, again, isn't going to take away from what's required in the statute but give us guidance, which is what a policy does, what we're going to do if this happens. Absolutely, I think that's absolutely fair. So, so for example, you could have 4C in the event that a, one of these qualifying individuals is not available to certify this language, the school district will go out and find one, in a more professional way of saying that, right. go out and find somebody to satisfy this requirement. Something as simple as that would cover yeah. everything. Yes. So yeah, we can get that in your next reading, that'd be great. Thank you. Any other recommendations on the first read? I, I just want to say too that I, I think that I support, well I don't think I know, <laughs> I support this. Uh, coming from my prior uh, profession, a uh, certificate on a diploma of having the bilingual C. Of course, I'm speaking of Spanish because that's how important it was in the courts. Uh, it's important in so many other languages. So if we could get a one or two or five or ten students this uh, spring, I would just be so elated by that. So um, thank you uh, for presenting this, Dr. Romero and Elena, and uh, we'll see what happens at the next meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I believe we're moving on now to what would be item number 14, consideration for action of policy 2.8.8 .8 through 2.8.91, the public address uh, to the board, third reading. I'll turn this over to Mr. Smith. And I will turn it right back over to the board. Okay. All right, so gentlemen, uh, this is the third read. Tonight's the meeting where we either accept uh, the policy changes that have been uh, submitted to us by uh, board president, uh, board uh, member Smith, of course, has been reviewed by legal counsel with some, uh, I don't know if it's really clean up or just a prettier copy that was submitted to us for uh, discussion and again for review. This would be the third time it's before the board per our policy. Um, uh, we can have uh, a motion to uh, approve and then go into discussion, or do we want to have discussion first, or where do we want to go? Motion first. So I, I, can, I can start off with discussion. I, I know that Mr. Vickers mentioned that he liked Mr. Kennedy's version of it. Uh, is that still correct, Mr. Vickers? Um, actually, I don't remember exactly what, his, uh, what the details of his were. Was so, I, was, you know, it, it, I've had a lot of discussions with people and, and read a lot of different things in the meantime. So, I yes. came to a different conclusion. <clears throat> so, I, um, I like the, the version that Mr. Kennedy submitted. Uh, it's almost identical to mine with, to my, the my proposed changes with um, a lot less words, and the only difference, and I spoke to him about it um, this evening, was the fact that it was five minutes of conversation instead of three. Everything else is the same. Um, also governed by the rules that we have, 
about stuff you are not allowed to discuss in public comment. So I just wanted to tell you that those of you who have taken the time to read both, both policies, both proposed changes to the policy, um, that one as well can be voted on should um, it be more appetizing for some of you rather than the changes that I made uh, to 2.88 and 2.8.9.1. I um, prefer uh, the one that we made because it ran through the uh, legal channels and it, I took the time to answer everybody's question that they had on it. So um, there, was, there were a couple of options uh, and if, there, if there's more, com more conversation that's, that's going to be had, I mean, I wouldn't have a problem doing it. Well, I think for point of order, I need to have a motion uh, to approve what would be the one submitted by you, Mr. Smith. See where that goes. <clears throat> uh, if, if we do that and we vote on it, then we cannot even consider any other option. So what are you proposing that I'm not, we call I, to? I was, I was opening it up for conversation, and apparently there, there's, there's none. Well, I can, I can give you some. Yes, please. Um, I, I've come to the conclusion that um, I like the, our current policy right now. There's, uh, we're going to be addressing a more uniform policy when we do the policy, work through that manual that the state has developed. But uh, opening it up to discussion on anything and everything, I think is not the role of this board. It's, it's uh, we're creating a town hall thing and that's, that's not why we meet. Uh, we can open it up to hear what people have to say about agenda items. But if, if we want a wider ranging discussion, I think actually we should schedule some town halls and have a, you know, a, a good wide ranging thing on various subjects that people want to bring up. But for the board meeting, I think we need to stick to what's on the agenda. And if individuals want something on the agenda, they can talk to one of the board members and ask them to get it put on or for president or the superintendent to create a, an agenda item for that particular thing. But uh, just to open it up for whoever wants to say whatever, I think would, is not, um, this isn't the right forum to do that. Okay. That's so, where I'm at. so I'll comment on that. Uh, for 75 districts in the state of New Mexico, it is the forum to do that. There's 14 that haven't adopted the policies yet, and 75% 75 of those boards do do it that way. This is the forum for that. And in fact, you actually said you were up for opening it as open as possible. That's what you stated in your campaign, if you want to call it that. And for us to continually shut out, we sent out a survey or a reminder, I guess is what it, I guess is what it was. We sent out a reminder that we were going to discuss this. It's the first time that I can remember that we've asked the public for anything, ever. It's right there on our webpage. Hey, we're discussing public comment. Don't forget we're discussing public comment. Are we going to start doing that for all the meetings? Should we do it for the next meeting when we're going to discuss um, superintendent goals and performance? Should we do it then? Or did we just do it for this particular one? Because it seems to me that we're going above and beyond to not pass this policy. And I'm trying to represent the school community, not the school district. Administration does not control what the public and what the staff are allowed to say at a school board meeting. And we are making it easy to not hear from them. And it, it really saddens me that we continue to shut them out. They are, the, they are the foundation of what we're all about. They're the reason that we're here. They're the parents of our kids. They're the pillars of our business community. And we are telling them to stay out of our boardroom. Stay out of this boardroom. When we want to hear from you, we'll send you a survey. Other than that, we don't want to hear from you. And that's sad. 
It really is, when you think about what it is we're doing here. That being said, I'm going to make a motion that we approve item number 14, the public address to the board 2.8.8 and 2.8.9.1. So I have a motion to approve uh, item number 14 for consideration for action, third reading on policy 2.8.8 through 2.8.9.1. I, I have the motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second with Mr. Hedon. Discussion. Today, Latina. Today, probably around three o'clock today, I was leaving one of the employees, and uh, I asked, "What are you doing for the evening?" I don't know what he told me. And he asked me what I was doing, and I said, "I got a board meeting." And he said, "Oh yeah, by the way, that public comment deal. How the heck can you guys? I'm going to clean it up a bunch. How can you guys?" sit up there as a board and not allow people to speak. We don't live in Russia. We don't live in China, North Korea. Tonight we got a polling from Sandoval to telling us how to do things. I mean, how we, where we're improved, where we need to improve, what we're doing good. That's the only way we're going to know how to do our jobs. We can't censor these people. We do have a policy on public comment, it's four or five pages and 20 boxes you have to fill out trying to make sure you don't speak. This was brought up, I think, in May or June before us. The effort and energy you guys have put in to push back on this is amazing. Are you guys that afraid to hear the truth? I don't want to surround myself with people that want to tell me how good I'm doing all the time. Okay? That guy took, chewed me out today. And you know what? I dropped the ball. We should have been pushing this harder in June and July. But we're already December, and we're still dealing with this? Shame on us. I cannot believe the effort you guys put in to censoring these people. Mr. Hino and I agree with you. Uh, the first time we brought it up, they said, well, we want to know if it's legal. So I went out and I proved to you it was legal. Well, I want to see Mr. Kennedy's version. I showed you Mr. Kennedy's version. I've done everything that you guys have asked me to do in your, in my opinion, delay tactic, because now it's six months down the road. And if you want to do the will of the few, then do that. But you represent the many. We're here to represent the many. And when you only represent the few, you are doing an injustice to the many. They have a right to then you tell them that they no longer have the right to be here. You haven't granted it in eight years, and you're certainly not going to consider it now. Not one person has come over here and signed for, up for public comment and said, I don't think this is a good idea. Not one person. Not one person has told me, I don't think this is a good idea. Not one. Now, you may have a different poll where everybody's telling you this is a horrible idea. I find it hard to believe that anybody in the public or a parent would tell you this is a bad idea. For you to let me voice my opinion, this is a horrible idea. I find it very hard to do that. Now you may be getting input from somewhere else, and that's fine. Like I said, I represent the many, and I will continue to represent the many. And I will bring this again as many times as it takes until people realize that this is their school district. This is their building. These are their children. And like I said at the very first meeting, they pay taxes. Here's your money. Here's your vote. Now don't come back until I need your money or your vote again. That's what we're telling them. And it, 
it's, it saddens me and I apologize profusely to the staff and to the public and to everybody that thinks this is a good idea. To everybody who believes that they are part of something that we're not letting you be a part of. I apologize profusely. But I could not outweigh the field. At the last month's meeting, I commented on where I was going to probably lean on this uh, policy. And of course, my decision has not changed. Um, I would like to just state that uh, I've heard from people in our district, parents. I've heard from employees. And one of the things that I've always been able to do and I, I, I uh, encourage and have always done myself is get as much training and learning and uh, uh, what this position is about. I have been to just about every meeting and every conference and every group uh, setting that there is workshop or otherwise to talk about the role of what this board does and the business of this board. And in every single time that I've had one of these events or one of these settings or one of these meetings, it is highly recommended by all of those that give recommendations that we not open it up to just anything. We have a policy that allows public comment for anything on the agenda. We're not shutting anybody out. If we're talking about it, if it's something we're considering as we sit here tonight, any member of the community could come up and talk to us about those items. We publish it in the news bulletin, we put it up on the postings, it's on the webpage. We are not shutting anybody out of this room. And I do resent <coughs> that because that's not a fair or truthful statement. But having said that, there is business this board has to do. We're required to do certain duties. And it could be distracting if we open it up to things that are not of the business of the board. And in our community and in our districts and when we're talking to parents and when we're talking to staff, there's a chain of command. There's a process that, that disgruntled parents have and parents that want to highlight or, or commend somebody that we tell them how to go about doing that. There's a process for that. And um, I believe we should follow that process. And I don't want to take away from that. My position has been that items that are on the agenda are open for public comment. That's my vote. That's how I feel. If you want to take it as the way Mr. Smith is spinning it, then you can take it that way. But that's not the business of this board. And I don't want to distract from what the business of this board is. And there is a way for anybody in the community to reach out to any of us. Our emails are on the webpage. Our phone numbers are on the webpage. Uh, you could run into us at Walmart or the gas station. Tell us what you think. That's your opportunity to tell us. That's how we vote. That's how we get elected. That's how we get removed, whatever the case may be. Um, I can't imagine that every single person who has advised school board members on what to do with this topic right here that tells you don't do it, number one, or only do it this way, doesn't have enough knowledge or experience in the state to give us that guidance, and I'm gonna follow it. That's my position. Yes, so, so you're right, we do have a, we do have a policy that uh, apparently people have tried, and I only know of six times, but we've only allowed one of them to speak Five times we have not. So by saying that we have a policy that we allow them to speak is inaccurate. And the business of this board is the community, period. It is the community. That's why we're here. So for me to spin it, as you put it, who do we think we are? Who do we think the five of us are that we can come up here, sit in front of this mic, and voice our opinion as long as we want? Yet we won't allow anybody else to do it. But we can sit up here and do it. What makes me better than a parent that's concerned with a bus route? Nothing. I am no better than any of them. I get to get hurt, they should be hurt. I do not have any more rights than they do. And the business of this board, and I've always felt it, is the community and it is the public and I actually 
feel very bad for that comment that they are not our business, because they are. That's the only reason. That's the only business that we have, is those students and that's the school community. Madam President, I, I disagree with them. My business is to be their voice, to be their ears and their eyes, and I do that. I don't, and, and they don't need to stand at a podium to put, put, put it out here. They can come to me, and I'll go directly to that man over there, Dr. Romero. I'll bring it to you if necessary. So to say just have anyone up here can spill whatever they want to spill, I totally disagree. And I think it's not that hard. There's two forms, not five pages. There's two forms. You can fill it out when you get there to get what's on the agenda, or you can fill it out 10 days prior to get it on the agenda, or you can call me, and I can get it on the agenda sooner. Okay? And as far as those readings, I didn't agree with yours. I didn't agree with Kennedy's. And that's why I left it like that. Okay? I, didn't, I like what we have in place, and I think it's only fair that it stays in place because I am concerned about all these people, employees, staff members, students. I don't want anyone just come up here and all of a sudden they, they go crazy and they just start saying whatever they want to say because we're going to let them say. We can't stop them. Once they get up there, we cannot stop them, all right? My way to stop them right now is fill out the forms, talk what's on the agenda, speak your piece. If you got any concerns, I'm on the web page, I'm at Walmart, I'm in every store. I've talked to a lot of people and they've told me, you guys are doing a great job. I'm not worried about that public comment. I've asked a lot of people I am in the district, and I go around. I'm retired. I, I'm going to a lot of places. You know, and I don't just show up but when it's convenient for a meeting, and I don't change scheduling for meetings because I can be here any time to be for the people. All right? So my opinion is I like the policy I've in place, and I'm with you, and I'd like to keep it that way. To be the voice of the people. So if somebody brings it to you, as you stated, you can bring it to us. You say somebody fills out a piece of paper, they can have the podium. Is the piece of paper some magic filter that when they step up there, they don't say anything wrong? It's a due process. It is a due process. Okay, so a it's due process just the way it just is. Come up here and talk. But the, fill out the form. What's on the agenda? Let's have a conversation. If you don't like it, call me something else. We can talk. Yeah, they've tried that and it doesn't work. It has not with me. Yeah, and, I, and I'm going to go ahead and I think we've <clears> got uh, a point of order here. Um, I think people have stated their positions and why their positions are what they are. I'm going to call for the vote. I, we still need some discussion. I'm not done yet. Go ahead again, Mr. Hedo, and I'm going to let you. Really? Really? Really. I'm going to call for the vote, but go ahead and make your piece what we want to say now. We've addressed this for seven months. I have heard so many different things come out of your mouth, Bruce, with this. Yes, I, the first time we talked about it, you said, I, we have to be careful because we can't make a facial expression. You remember that one? Yeah, because yeah. anything they do up there, we, we, we offend them on the First Amendment rights. We sit here, they speak. If we not agree, that's making the assumption we're agreeing with what they say or just or not saying, right? That's what you said. That's what I said. You, we, you, have to be, you have to concern yourself with your facial point of, expression. And point of order again, gentlemen. The like I said, hold on, Mr. Hedon, hold on. I don't think it, because it's been mentioned so many times that we've done this five months, six months, whatever the number was. If we know our positions, we know our positions. Nobody's going to change their mind at this point. And by getting angry and... Oh maybe rude with one another, isn't going to change it either. And if you are going to have a comment, please go through the chair so that we're not getting anybody, uh, I don't know, trying to bring it down the tone. Like I said, I've allowed you to speak. Mr. Bennett has answered your question. Do you have something else you'd want to say? Yes, I do. So the first comment was we had to worry about our facial expressions. The next comment was you wanted another attorney to address it. Um, I don't even know how much that cost us. We just disregarded that recommendation. We got another attorney. And not once have we run with that. Last meeting I heard you had a poll and it was 
Can you show us those numbers and the questionnaire that you sent out for that? Conversation, man, just adding numbers here and there. I didn't know I needed okay. to keep a poll. Do you have a poll? I didn't say I had a poll. Well, I, I didn't say that. So what does it matter? You're the one who said it. I'm asking there you because I'm asking you. Point, asking you. point, of, order, okay. point, point of order. Point of order, gentlemen. Like I said, it's, so hold on. Well, can, Go ahead, can we just keep this as going through the chair and not dialogue between members? Okay. So, Chair, I've heard for seven months different things all over the map. And that's fine. That's fine. My last question to you guys is, why would you guys wait seven months and waste that much money going through different attorneys when you had your minds made up. I mean, that money could have gone to the classrooms. That could have gone somewhere else. <laughs> Madam Chair, I never went to legal, so I didn't spend no money on this. No, you did it. The taxpayers did. No, you did. You guys are asking questions, not me. Chair, my question to you right now is, how many times did I go to an attorney requesting questions on the, on this public comment? I have no idea, Mr. Hadon. I'm sure that there have been some visits with uh, county attorneys on your behalf more than once. Was Regarding there, this item? I have no idea. Zero. Okay. Okay. Zero. So, any other discussion? I'm moving on. Okay, hearing no other discussion, I'm gonna call for the vote. I got the first and the second. I'm gonna, where's my number? Mr. Hedon, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Bennett, how do you vote? No. Mr. Vickers, how do you vote? No. Mr. Smith. I'm sorry for the many. I vote yes. And I vote no. Motion to, or policy change to, um, 2.8.8 and 2.8.91 is not passed. We're moving on to action item number 15, approval to untable item that was tabled on October 25th, 2022, approval of resolution 2022-004, interpretation of board policy pending comprehensive policy review. I need a motion to untable this item. I'll motion to untable this item. Mr. Bennett, motions uh, to untable. I need a second. I second that. Mr. Vickers will um, second to untable. I would imagine there's a discussion or a vote on this. To untable, I guess there still needs to be a vote. Yes. Okay. Mr. Hedon, how do you vote? To untable this item. No. Uh, Mr. Bennett, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Vickers, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Smith, how do you vote? I vote yes. And I'll also vote yes. Item is untabled. Now we will move to the approval of this resolution. On the agenda item, we did, uh, Mr. Smith, I think there was some questions about the attorney that who, who had written the resolution to be present. Um, she could not be present tonight. She's traveling but she did send representation, and I know she's here somewhere. Hi, come forward, please. If you could please identify yourself on the podium uh, and recognize uh, that we do have somebody from the law firm who has had conversation with uh, Mrs. Elena Gallegos on this resolution to speak to us tonight on the questions that Mr. Smith had. Um, I'd like to go ahead, uh, maybe allow you to introduce yourself, tell us why you're here, and then maybe Mr. Smith, if you want to ask your questions. Go ahead, ma'am. Good evening, Madam President, Superintendent Romero, members of the board. My name is Roxy de Santiago. I'm with the, uh, with the law firm of Walsh Gallegos. I work directly with Elena Gallegos, who is the individual who prepared the resolution for the board's consideration based on conversations with um, various board members. I understand that there are some questions. I am happy to answer those questions to the best of my ability. Um, so I, I believe those come from Member Smith. So they do. Um, I don't know what this is. I okay. Have, I have no clue. First of all, I've, 
I'm not even sure what board members asked for this. Okay. I don't know that uh, to answer that last question, which board members asked for this resolution, I don't know that it was any specific board member. Instead, it was a, a determination based on a series of conversations. There were some meetings and some reviews of other policies in which our office determined after reviewing those policies that there are some concerns about the policies exceeding um, the authority under the law. So to step back just for a second to put it all in context, when you have local district policies, those have to rely on the authority under the regulations, which in turn rely on the authority under the statute at a, at a state level, which in turn rely upon the federal um, law itself. So you sort of have a hierarchy of laws and regulations. The district policies themselves have to conform with the regulations, the state law, and the federal law. The easiest way to put that into context would be, for example, if someone were to sue the school district for a violation of an ADA matter, uh, um, Americans with Disabilities, your policy may not have anything that speaks directly to the Americans with Disabilities Act, or it may. And say, for example, that they sue the district because they say you are not following your local policy. But if your local policy is contrary to or doesn't include all the provisions of the Americans with Disabilities Act, that individual would still um, be successful in their lawsuit because even though the policy itself says one thing and the district is, is or is not following the policy, what is preeminent, what is in the top of the hierarchy, is the federal law. And so if the, poli if the district is not following the federal law, regardless of what it says in its policy, that person will still win their lawsuit. So this resolution came about as a result of something akin to that circumstance. In the state of New Mexico, we have this general law called House, everybody refers to it as House Bill 212. And the provisions of House Bill 212 generally set out the divisions of the rules and, and duties between the esteemed board and a superintendent within the district. Those have been codified, those have been included into law, both um, in the statute and in the administrative code, so in the state statute and then the regulations. Both that state statute and the regulations, both of those supersede what a district policy says. So your local policy cannot go against what is in the regulation or what is in the state law. This resolution came about as a result of looking at several different local policies for Los Luna schools in which it was determined that it was somewhat likely that these policies violated that um, regulation and that state statute that indicated what the separation was between the duties of this esteemed board and its assigned superintendent. The resolution itself says that from this point forward when the resolution is passed until that time when your committee uh, member Smith finally gets all of those policies in line and reviews them and makes sure that they're all in line with the federal law, the state law, and the regulation, that during that interim period of time, to the extent that any of the local policies violate, violate either the regulation or the state law, that the superintendent will act in conformance with the regulations and the state law themselves. So that's what the resolution is intended to do. It's intended to ensure that in the interim period of time, while your policies are being redone, while you're working with Mr. Kennedy, while you're working with the committee, that during that time, um, the superintendent can act in accordance with his um, assigned duties under the state law and under the regulations. And, and as drafted, it is primarily intended, if you look at the resolution itself, it is primarily intended to address those issues in which um, the superintendent is taking action. That's why it refers to the statute 22, um, 2254, which is the duties of the local school board. It also um, refers to um, 22514, which is the superintendent's 
power. That's the state law that um, defines what the powers are for the two entities. And then finally, it uh, refers to the administrative code, um, 6.29.19, which in that entire administrative code assigns the duties for both the board and for the superintendent. So the resolution is drafted, is intended to address primarily um, issues of personnel matters. I hope that answered your question. If not, I can give it another shot. No, no, so I do have some questions. So the sure. reason I asked which board member is because we have a policy that says when a board member asks a question of an attorney, we should get a briefing of that. And, and, and I did not see that. So that's the reason I asked that. Right. I, didn't, I didn't see the briefing of that. So, and I just want to intercede. There was an email sent out by Mrs. Elena Gallegos to every single board member of the uh, discussion that was had, the questions that were asked of her, and uh, there was disclosure. So I With just this. Uh, yes. Okay. That that's okay. So You're just right. to that restate was, that did that happen. Was, that was that was after, but that's fine. Anyways, my question is, if I'm reading, if I'm hearing you correctly. And I, and I get the House Bill 212. I have no desire to be involved in personnel. <laughs> but what this resolution is saying is we are going to allow the determination of what fits into House Bill 212 and what does not to the superintendent. It will be his decision on which board policies are on either side of the fence. The House Bill 212 is actually pretty fairly straightforward, as as are the regulations and the state law itself. So, yes, does there have to be some level of trust in terms of the superintendent that the that the board has hired? Yes, absolutely. He will have to make decisions on a regular basis, um, and and whether or not he reports to you what those decisions are, um, you, you may or may not want to know whether or not the janitor was out on sick leave, that's entirely with that, within his discretion. But you may ask him to come back into the board and, and give you some you know, uh, updates on what he does in the cabinet level, for example, um, going back to your conversation earlier today. So does it mean that you have to trust your superintendent? Yeah, it probably does, but even, even without this resolution, you still have to trust your superintendent on a regular basis to ensure that your superintendent stays within his own lane as well. Each party here, the board and the superintendent has their lane. And when those individuals cross over to the other lane is when um, there has to be a discussion. And so if, if any of you believe that the superintendent is stepping out of line with House Bill 212 or the statute as it's codified in, uh, in, this, in the, in the statutes or in the regulations either way, that's a discussion that you have to have with your superintendent, whether this resolution is passed or not. The intent of the resolution is to ensure that your actions moving forward allow the superintendent to act according to the statute and the regulation as it currently exists, simply because the policies themselves, as each of you well know, have been out of date. It probably has not been updated consistently since House Bill 212 passed. It's very complicated. Um, we still, as attorneys, have to deal with it on a regular basis, and we're still learning it ourselves. So I understand the quandary that you're in. And I do understand your question as well, uh, Member Smith, but it is an issue of trust in terms of, of the individuals that you have hired to act on behalf of the district. So my only concern with that is, one, we, in my opinion, we, we don't follow our policies always. Two, earlier we had a discussion about giving up a couple of our responsibilities board policies, and now we're voting to have them determined which is our responsibility and which is the superintendent's responsibility by the superintendent. So this, this, this process seems to be taking away the governing of the board policies from the board. And you're right, there is a level of trust. I get that. But, but if I may, Member, Member Smith, in fact, what I'm trying to say is that I'm, this resolution is not to take away any power because ultimately this board does not have the authority to create a policy that would go against the state law or the regulation. 
And so to the extent that this board did in fact at one point in the past create a policy that now violates the law and now violates the regulation, it doesn't have any authority to draw that back and say, yes, I know it's against the law, but I still want to keep this authority. That in and of itself will lead to problems. So, so the intent of the resolution is to, is to assist this board with ensuring that they conform with the requirements and under the statute and under the regulation, not to draw back any authority, because in truth, you, you should not have had that authority, and you didn't have the authority to pass that policy initially. I don't think it was this board that passed that policy. I'm just saying, in general, you didn't have that authority, so we're not clawing anything back. And do we know what specific policies we're talking about? Um, it, we didn't list any specific policies here in the resolution. Um, we did list the specific laws that needed to be followed. So for example, you're not going to see anything here about procurement code because procurement code is directly within something that um, has to do with finances and maybe something that the board has something to do with, right? So we didn't want to go through and list all your policies. In addition to that, we didn't want to list the policies because we know that you're also in the middle of the process of working with Mr. Kennedy to get all of your policies reviewed. And sometimes all of the policies are reviewed all at once. Sometimes they're reviewed in staggered in, in stages, like first you do the student policies, and then you do the personnel policies, and then you do the board policies. So we didn't want to go through. We were not also, we were not asked to go through all of the policies. What we did include was that final paragraph that says, be it further resolved, wherein under that paragraph, it is, it is incumbent upon the superintendent to review the policies and bring those forward to the board to say, I believe in this policy, this is an instance in which the, um, the policy itself violates H House Bill 212, just to make it short instead of listing all the regulations and the statutes. So uh, we're talking about specific policies, not necessarily specific inquiries. Well, if I, if I may clarify, Member Smith, the last paragraph indicates that the board mem that the that the superintendent is supposed to bring it to the board to indicate which specific policies. The entire resolution itself does not speak about any specific policies. Instead, it says we're going to follow the law, the statute, and the regulations that divides the two lanes between the school board and the superintendent. The last paragraph is intended to include um, the board and the superintendent in an ongoing conversation about which policies it is that the superintendent or the board, based on the discussion, feels would fall within this resolution. But that's a discussion that would happen. It wouldn't just be a, I think this violates House Bill 212. It that, would be a discussion. Under the last paragraph, the superintendent would bring forth, ident his duty would be to identify those policies. Um, I do believe, Member Smith, that there are some clear, um, there are some clear instances in which the superintendent can say, this is clearly within my uh, area of expertise. For example, issuing contracts to employees. Clear, no question. I don't think that the superintendent has to come in front of the board and say, uh, hey, members of the board, I think our policy that says that you issues the board, the um, employee contracts violates House Bill 212. I think we can all agree that under the very clear provisions of the regulation that is within his, um, within his authority. So I go back to the question of trust, that to the answer of trust, I should say instead, is that there are times when it's very clear and it's gonna be clear to all of you and it's gonna be clear to the superintendent. When it's not so clear, it is probably where your main concern lies. Um, I can't answer that because I don't know which specific policy we're talking about. I, can't, I, could, I could stand here all night and give you examples of when he should or should not come forward because every day within a school district is going to bring forward a whole different slew of questions and a whole different slew of decisions that the superintendent has to make on a daily basis. And he has to be able to make those decisions in order for the school district to run appropriately. It is his job as the CEO, as the superintendent, as the top person in a district to ensure that the district runs smoothly. So to the extent he has to make these decisions on a regular basis, 
yes, you're going to have to trust him. If you find some decision that he makes you think is outside of his lane, that's a discussion that each one of you, each one of you as members of this board can go and have with the superintendent. And if I could just throw in there, that's true already. This resolution just puts it down in writing that we all agree to stay in our lane. And if and when there's a question, we'll talk about it. That is correct, uh, Madam President. It, do, it does one more thing in that it, it acknowledges that the current policies as written at the district level may not always conform with the law right. and the regulation. And it allows this board to recognize that there will be times when the superintendent may engage in actions that look like they're contrary to the policy, but yet are consistent with state regulation and state law. Thank you. Any other board members have questions for the attorney? Madam Chair, yes. uh, so my understanding also was that we have policies that actually conflict with each other. That is correct. And, and so that the superintendent has to make a decision as to exactly how to proceed because of that. And that's one of the reasons we're doing a comprehensive redo of all the policies. You mentioned that this would be in effect only in, until the time when we finally approve a policy manual. I don't see that language in here, but I may be missing it. up here at the top, but it doesn't give an end date. It, it, it says pending, because, Member Vickers, if I, if I may forgive my interruption. Um, it says pending because we don't, we can't put an end date um, on it. You, you certainly, we all heard the discussion from Member Smith earlier today, um, it just in this meeting about how long it could take to get in any set of um, policies approved. Um, in, in our experience working with other districts, it's anywhere from six months to a year before all of the policies are reviewed and approved. So we couldn't put an end date. This resolution, however, you can easily amend it to make sure that it says precisely what your concern is. It, it could very easily be added um, at the very end, another line that says, you know, this interim resolution expires upon the approval of policies pursuant to um, our agreement to work with um, Mr. Kennedy. It's, this resolution is written um, can be changed to fit the needs of this board. It, it, it's not it's not set in stone. So, Madam Chair, I would recommend that we do that. That we we state clearly that this automatically expires once we have approved a comprehensive policy manual, whatever date that is. Would that be something your uh, firm could do for us? Since Absolutely. Since wrote this uh, yeah. up for us, I don't know if it would be an, uh, an item that becomes it, it further resolved that, I, a paragraph, and yes. then adding that in there for consideration? We could, we could talk about it today and, and create the exact language today so that it can be voted on today, or I can come back at another meeting. So my, my initial impression would be, um, would be that be it further resolved that this pending, um, that this resolution is valid until the Las Lunas School Board passes. Thinking, I'm thinking out loud as I speak. I see all the faces. <laughs> <laughs> until the Las Lunas School Board passes all of the, until the Las Lunas School Board completes its comprehensive policy review. Okay, so I'm in favor if you if you've got exact language I, to uh, propose an amendment to add that sentence to the resolution, so that we we have a definite end time. Would you like me to read my sentence back? Can I, it, Could you, for uh, record keeping, make sure that we have that same language in our record? Be it further resolved that this resolution expires upon completion of the comprehensive policy review by the Las Luna School Board. I have a question. Yes, sir. So I, I'm assuming that when you guys do a policy, say you, work, you work, do the first one and you guys are going to hash it out, you'll bring it to the board for approval? 
Yes. Okay. So can that language be put in there like that once each policy has been updated instead of waiting till the end? So uh, follow what I'm saying. I I do, Member Keaton. I, I do understand what you're saying, and and in fact, um, it's a legitimate concern because it is possible, for example, that. Um, that the board would approve, as I said earlier, all of the student policies in one go and then come back at the next meeting and approve all of the personnel policies. So if you'll give me a minute, let me see how I can revise it so that it addresses that and then we'll hear from Member Vickers as well. First. Well, before yeah. you go First. to that trouble, I believe we have agreed in the workshop we had with Mr. Kennedy that we would have basic approval of language and policies, but they wouldn't go into force until the whole oh, manual was done, done. Uh -huh. and okay. we would approve the entire manual at one time. Okay. I, is, is that it? what we discussed with yes. John Kennedy? Mm -hmm. So we, we would be doing the whole manual in one vote. And the reason, if, if I may, uh, is that a lot of policies touch other policies. That's true. And so when you're passing one in personnel, it might affect something down the road, but you don't know it till you get down the road. So I think that was one of the reasons that you pass it as a whole package. Yes. So I don't, I, I agree then that maybe it should stay as is until it's all approved as a whole package. Madam President, that is true that there are times when the boards vote as a package for them, for them all. It depends on your committee and, and Member Smith and Mr. Kennedy and how they decide to, to complete um, the policy review. Um, so, I, Mr. Hedon, is okay, that? I'm good. That's so, good. if we're uh, correcting this, I, I do not like the language of item, uh, paragraph one all existing policies shall be interpreted by the superintendent, consistent with uh, the NMSA and, and, and the other items. I, I don't understand how broad that statement is. It, it's broad. It's it very means, broad. <laughs> it means all policies. It, all policies means all policies. And I, and I will say again, Member Smith, the reason that it says all policies is because our firm was not asked to review all policies. So we do not know to what extent any individual policies, except for the you know few policies that we were asked to review, actually go contrary to, in our opinion, um, the statutes that and, are listed and, here. And that would be the language that needs to be added. I would think um, all existing policies shall be interpreted by the superintendent that cross that line that you just mentioned, the verbiage you just used. Not, not, not a broad statement like all existing policies shall be interpreted by the superintendent. Well, but it says by the superintendent consistent with the law. Right. Consistent with the law, but what we're mostly concerned with is in violation of those, not consistent with it, right? But M Member Smith, if I may, in order for a policy to be in violation would mean that it is not consistent. True, true. But the, the wording about just all, in, all existing policy shall be interpreted by the superintendent. Consistent, consistent with Consistent with that means that we can't just say, I think that's in violation of House Bill 212. It either is or it is not, correct? That, no, that we're lawyers, so we're always going to say depends, right? There, there's it a it lot depends. Of, that you're right. There's a lot of depends in this broad statement. And right. I just want to make sure that we're not getting to the point where uh, uh, policies that aren't crossing that line are being interpreted as are. But, if but policy even if they are we have to follow the statute and the statute is outlined in paragraph one so it does it, although it says shall interpret uh, consistent with all policies he does that already and it has to be within the statute as written so having a little bit of experience with statutes uh, although it sounds like a broad statement you'd have to include all the language within all of those statutes to get to the bottom line so it's Although it's a big paragraph, it doesn't end with shall interpret. It goes through the whole statute as written, talking about the call and the title of that statute, 
that already give the powers and duties to the district superintendent. So it's not giving him anything he doesn't already have. Then why is it in here? Because we have policies that are illegal. Okay. And he has to make a decision every day. That's why. Okay, so if he's making that decision every day, I don't see why we're pointing it out. But that's my opinion. That's just my opinion. All of this could be done, or should be done, let me rephrase that, should be done without a resolution. We should be doing this already. Sure. Okay. That's fine. I, I appreciate it. I, you came to me before the meeting and I told you I have no clue, so I have a clue now. So thank, thank you. you very much for that. You're welcome. Any other board members have questions? Yes, Mr. Hedon. Ma'am, you, uh, you stated there needs to be a trust level with us and our superintendent. Correct. And I'm just going to use this as an example because I don't think he would do it. But you heard you heard us earlier talking about uh, our organizational chart and the budget, Correct. and we're in charge of the budget and the organizational chart. Correct. I mean, I don't think he would do something like that and you know hide behind that. But if he would go, I mean, how do we protect ourselves as a board to make sure there's that trust issue to still have that oversight? Well. Let me separate those two issues um, first. Hold on, because because we're allowing him to do that, doing this resolution, right? What, uh, okay, that. our role is the budget mm -hmm. and an organizational chart. Um, with all due respect, Member Hedon, I'm not entirely sure that your role as a board is to complete an organizational chart. To, to finance it, though. Uh, to finance it, yes. To create the budget to assess it, yes. Um, your power are, are to develop the rules, um, to employ the superintendent. I'm reading this straight off, uh, off of the statute. Um, to review and approve the annual school district budget, to acquire, lease, and dispose of property, to have the capacity to sue and be sued, um, to acquire property by eminent domain, and a whole other series, uh, other series there. I believe that creating a budget is clearly within the authority of this board. I am not sure that I know precisely which policy allows this board to create an organizational chart for the entire school district. And so um, My, I don't know that that's within your authority. Uh, but your me, question, member. Let me rephrase it another way. If there's a budget already and in the middle of that budget year, the superintendent changes something. We already allowed him by passing this resolution to do that, right? So th those, those intermingle two separate issues. For example, your budget, when you approve, you approve big line item issues. Mm -hmm. You approve, for example, let's just say, I know this is vastly under numbering it, but because it's easy math for me, you approve $100,000 for teacher salaries. Let's just say that's the budget that you approve. During that school year, it's, it's very clear that it may or may not be possible for the superintendent to fill all of the school um, positions for $100,000 worth of teachers. Sometimes there's a shortage, sometimes you can't find people, um, and sometimes there's an increase in the number of students that attend the district and you need to hire more teachers and go beyond the $100,000. So every time that um, you approve a budget for $100,000 in teachers, it's not a requirement that the superintendent absolutely fill $100,000 $100, in teachers. He's he, it's within his discretion, given the budget that has been approved, to hire as many teachers as necessary to complete the duties assigned to him, which is to ensure that there is um, a good educational program and all of the services that the, that the students need. Whether or not that requires up to $100,000, I'm sure that number is, is, is entirely, this is probably more like a million dollars, um, but, but he, he could yeah. only fill $750,000 worth of teachers and that may be, in his opinion, sufficient to fulfill the purposes of the district. In contrast, if he needs to go above that number, then that may require a budget, a bar, that yes. has to come before the board for a bar if, there, if that is necessary. But if there is no bar necessary, if the funds are already allocated and approved, then that's within his discretion. 
Okay, so that's my question. So he has to come before us before, I mean, for a budget adjustment that's totally out of line with what was already approved. I, I, you're, what, you're, what do you do then? But remember, he don't, if, I don't want to get too deep into this conversation because I feel that, that there's a very specific example that you're trying to get to. No, 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 no. I just, we're, we're relinquishing those duties, okay? You said it. We're going to be trusting him. And all of a sudden, it's not matching up from the budget that was approved to what we're spending now. Okay. First of all, uh, you're not relinquishing duties because statutorily they're already his. However, to the extent that the actual expenditures of the school do not align with the school budget that was approved by this board, then to that extent, you can ask him that question. Why is this not aligning? And have him come before the board to explain why the ex actual expenditures are not aligning with the budget that was approved. But is there a matter of trust? Because you're, you're, uh, you're approving $100,000 worth of teacher um, salaries. It's within his discretion to decide who gets those and how many teachers are covered under that amount of money. So there's, there will always be an amount of trust that you're going to have to place in your superintendent. It's your, it's your job as a school board to hire someone that you trust. And if you don't, then that's reflected in his evaluations and his contracts in the years to come. So I have a more specific question, but I will ask you this weekend. OK, well, we will see you this weekend. <laughs> because there it's free. <laughs> that's also true. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes. I believe there is a motion to amend this with the language that was proposed. Mr. Vickers, I think you, you worded it in a motion with the language for it to cease once the policies have been approved. Company and that policy language was has been given for record. So there's a motion. I don't have a second. Do I get a second to approve resolution 22-004? Okay, so I got Vickers uh, on the motion. I got Mr. Bennett on the second. Any other discussion we need, need to have on resolution 22-004? So, so the motion and second in regards the amendment? Yes. yes. Not, not the actual resolution yet, correct? With the amendment. Just the amendment that adds the extra. Well, I think then you need Seven. to clarify it, Mr. Vickers, because I understand yeah. it to be approving the resolution with the amended version verbiage you've added. Okay. That's and fine. That's, I can make my motion. Is that what you believe your second to be? Yep. Sure. That's what I did. That's fine. Okay. So we have a motion and a second to approve the resolution. Any other discussion or can I call for the vote? Okay. I'm going to call for the vote. Um, Mr. Hiron, how do you vote? No. Mr. Vickers, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Bennett, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Smith, how do you vote? No. And I vote yes. Resolution 22-004 passes interpretation of the board policy pending comprehensive policy review. Next item up on the agenda is the approval of the election boundary options. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, tonight we have Colleen here to talk to us about some of the um, conclusions of the multiple meetings that we've had for the community. Uh, regarding the, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, boundary options. Uh, we had a number of uh, meetings that were set up both uh, to allow people to come in person and allow to have uh, virtual so we could try to get as many people as possible to participate. Uh, we did, I believe, have um, a couple of pieces of feedback that came back. Um, I know that the board was presented with this uh, a few weeks ago. And so tonight, uh, we are here to try to come to a conclusion with what option we want to look at. And I just want to remind the board that it is important that we um, come up with a decision so that we can put this in place uh, before, so we can meet all the statutory requirements for that. So with that, Colleen, I'm going to turn it over to you and see if you want to just uh, get, us, get us going with conversation and then we can turn it over to the board to discuss the different options. Okay. Good evening. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Romero, I'm Colleen Martinez with uh, Visions and Planning. 
Um, a few weeks ago, we did uh, present three different options uh, to the board in terms of the voting uh, districts um, and the series of maps and stuff. And um, it's really critically important that we do get that approved this evening because we do have to do a lot of work on our back end before uh, submitting it to the Secretary of State, County Clerk's Office. There's a lot of data and things that we have to put together based upon the options selected. All three options are viable. They do have, we are required to balance population within uh, plus or minus 5% of the mean. Um, we did ho hold five uh, or six public meetings um, for input. We didn't have but minimal input as part of that process. Um, and so, um, you know, we've had opportunities to review that. We did provide an interactive public map uh, as part of that for the district website, as well, you know, running through all of those presentations. Um, and I don't know what you have discussed and thought about on any of those options, but they're all viable. Um, they all have, um, you know, meet the criteria that is required under federal law and as well state law and under the Federal uh, Voting Rights Act. So I stand for any questions that you may have on those, um, but I think they all are pretty good options. Committee members. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, do you have uh, slides of those three options? Yes, we do have some of those prepared from the presentation. There isn't any more Why don't we take a three minute recess Please. so uh, we could get those maps up on the board and uh, take a potty break uh, as quickly as possible. Get back to your seats. Three Thank minutes. you. Three minutes. All right.
Thank you. Okay. I'm going to call the meeting back to order. That was five instead of three, but I appreciate you all getting back into position. Uh, we have all been handed a hard copy of the options. Uh, Ms. Colleen, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Well, thank you. So, um, Madam President, and when we look at option one here, um, it's, let me see here. This is a little version. <laughs> um, as, as I've gone through this before, um, you know, all the population from District 4 is, was the largest area. So we've had to shift all the population from uh, west to east. And so we have population that is, there's a little area above the north of Main Street and a little bit below Main Street that we've had to shift to the, to the west. And so, you know, all of our, the population, we have to keep within this range of 9,469 to 10,465 because we have a target to balance everything um, right at uh, 9,967. That is our target range. Um, the district only grew by about 1,600 people over 10 years, according to the U U.S. Census. Um, but that's the data point that we have to use. We have to use the U.S. Census information because that is the one target in time that all changes that are made to se um, Senate districts, co um, congressional districts, um, both uh, statewide and uh, uh, federally, have to be made on. It's that one snapshot on time. We can't, we can't take into account you know, that there's more people moved in since then. Um, that the census may have been wrong, any of those counts, we have to just take what those numbers are as the, um, right now. So in option one, um, we do have some shifts. I don't know if we need to go over individually each and every one of them in detail. Um, and, and Colleen, I'll just step in right there. I know we've had the several workshops and I know um, for the most part we didn't get a very big attendance. I know I attended all of them except for one, I think. Um, so board members, we can do the whole presentation on all the maps again if you need to. And of course, I'm open to do that. Um, or do some of the members already want to go into discussion and talk about what options look uh, you know, better for them? So Colleen, thank you. And, and let's see what they want as a board. If we okay. need a lot more information, I think we needed to just see the hard copies. So uh, board members, what do you think? I'm chair. Sure. Uh, if I could uh, put in my opinion on these three maps, um, I prefer this map one. My district is the green area, and, and it really doesn't matter that it's my district. It's just in general. So if you go to option two, um, the large map on option two, so you see that green area down below that one, right? Mm -hmm. Go to option three, the full map, and the same green area. But if you go back to one, it doesn't include you that. You don't area. have those, and all it does is it takes a little bit more on the from the west at the top there, and it makes for a much more contiguous district. And to me, that makes more sense when, when the districts are basically, you know, a compact geometrical figure. So that is why I prefer one. And that, I'll just say that, and uh, I don't care about the demographics or whatever, it's just, it just looks like a more normal district. Okay. And that's all I have to say. No, I'm any other board members' discussion on any maps? Yes, Mr. So uh, I, th I might have asked you this last time. Who drew these? In terms of who, who, who we we prepared the you changes. Prepared it yes, based on the numbers. Right? Yes, based okay. on the numbers because we the intent is based on the law is to make minimal changes, and that's you know even though some of them appear a little bit larger than others, you know. 
you could go two streets over, for example, and you get five people in Los Lunas, and you can go two streets over in a different part of Los Lunas, and you could get 300 people. Right. right. And so that was part of the challenge, depending upon which portion of town that you were in. That's where some of these changed a lot, in, or it looks like they're bigger, or they're smaller. Right. Yeah, so I get the geographic. Mine is the blue one, so it's huge. But there's just not a lot of people between a couple mm -hmm. of the points. Um, so I, I was looking at the op options in detail, and the District 5 changes, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, all seem to say the same thing as far as Sickler Road is concerned. Everything on the east side of Sickler Road is no longer in District 4. Correct. Correct, no matter which option it is. Correct, and, okay. that, and that had to do with yeah. the way the population counts were, um, because even on the north side, we had too much population, and then the south side, it wasn't quite enough, and trying to find that fine balance was very, very difficult. And if you saw where on the north side it was very fixed and cutting the way that we did, we had to cut where you know no future houses were gonna get built and all of that. We did do that different cut, I think, on option three with Sickler Road and kind of going down to you know to the very bottom part of the right. district a little bit differently. But there's really nothing there. We have the prison and we have all of that stuff there. Right. But there, there wasn't a lot. There could be some future homes down the road that would then move over, you know, into the next district. But, you know, that's down the road. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One of the. Uh, portions of District 1 uh, that goes into District 2 play with the area of Peralta and Valencia. And um, you're, if I'm reading it right, you're following Highway 47. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> all three of these options take a portion of that area. Correct. Probably the bigger portion is going to be what looks like option two. Correct. Over time, based upon looking at, because some of the other work that we're working on with the district, we're tracking housing, we're tracking a lot of that stuff. We've been monitoring that for over a year plus now. And looking at future population changes within the district, especially with some of the growth that's occurring in district. Five, we do know that there is some happening in three. We know all of that, but just knowing some of that population growth, you know, all of that is happening on the west side and looking down the road 2030, you know, even 2040, we're gonna have this shift and these districts eventually are going to start changing their formation over time. Um, and that that is going to be something to be aware of because there is going to be kind of no choice in order to maintain that balance of that plus or minus 5% of the mean as Los Lunas grows, the, the way these shapes are now, they will, they will have to change. And you're going to see the things move, everything move from east towards the west you know, because it's gonna to have to come over and start to, ca to capture some of that growth over time because in order to start maintaining that balance. Because this general area that I'm looking at right here um, doesn't grow a lot. It's Correct. It's kind of set. So the growth is happening in the outskirts. So in looking ahead to 10 years from now, where would we're going to probably have to continue then, you're saying, to continue to shift yes. more towards the west. Correct. Okay. With some population growth, I think we've talked about uh, coming up in maybe District 3 mm -hmm. and maybe a little bit more in District 2 up on the outskirts. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else questions, Mr. Bennett? Well, Madam Chair, if there's no other discussion, I'll make a motion to 
that we approve uh, option one. So at this time, option one is on the table for a motion to approve. Do I get a second to option one? I'll second that. Mr. Bennett uh, seconds uh, the approval of option one. Discussion, gentlemen. Not he hearing any discussion, are we ready to call for the vote for approval of election boundary options? <clears throat> I'll start with Mr. Hedon. Yes. Mr. Vickers? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. And I'll vote yes. It looks like uh, it's a unanimous for option one for the approval of uh, our election boundary options. All right. Colleen, thank you for all thank the you. time and attention yes. you put into this uh, process. Thank you for all the meetings that we sat in through. <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, the work that uh, got done. I think we have paperwork to sign as board members tonight, so you get all that. Yes, and we need, we'll process. be getting the, the meeting minutes, uh, Madam Chair, and then we're going to be working on the back end of all the paperwork that we have to provide uh, for the state okay. um, while the meeting minutes are getting completed and stuff. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right, gentlemen. Thank you. All right, so um, back on to the agenda. We're on item 18 for the finance committee items. Uh, the portion for discussion was 18AI, finance committee ID, uh, items, approval of reports for October 2022, and schedule of checks written. I believe, Mr. Hedon, this was your discussion? Yes, this is questions for the uh, chair of the finance committee. This is the first time I've seen a bunch of, well, a big portion going towards Osuna School District Transportation Department. And it has August transportation, I, it says August, I hope that's what it says. And then September, is that true? Uh, when we talked about this in the finance committee items, yes, it was true. And if I recall the discussion through uh, that committee and what was brought forth to us, uh, it was the final bills that had come in. There had been some delay in uh, receiving some of these things. So the bills that uh, came out got paid now in October versus when the original submission of the resolution uh, happened, or not resolution, but the bill or invoice got submitted. I know that we do have, um, I'm gonna draw a blank. I want to call you Vicky, but I know Sandy, it's not Vicky. Sandy. Sandy, Sandy, I'm sorry, Sandy. <laughs> we have her present. If you do have some more questions about uh, uh, the amount of checks or why they were written, but uh, we did cover it. It was to explain to the uh, finance committee in detail as to what those items were and why they were there. Okay, there was another one. I think our policy states when there's a check written to one of us, we're supposed to disclose it. There was one written to you for reimbursement. Can you tell us what that was about? Uh, there was a travel uh, that was uh, that I took, um, and that was a reimbursement for my coffee, I believe, at the airport. That, where was that? I'm trying to look at that check go. Where was, was that travel to? Dollars or something like that. It may have been a little bit more, maybe twenty. Where was uh, that travel to? To California. And that was for what kind of? It was for the Cupertino visit uh, to Apple to look at. Uh, the schools that had been given that distinguished um, uh, award, as well as look at other options that uh, Apple was providing to us for educational purposes as a district. Okay. Uh, board members went, the superintendent went, and I was invited to attend. Everything was paid for. Uh, that way, my only reimbursement was for coffee that morning. Okay. Our meals were paid and transportation was covered. That was the last, that was the only question. Okay. Any other questions um, on the finance committee items for checks written or schedule of checks written? <clears throat> okay, then I need a motion. A motion to approve it. Mr. Bennett has motion to approve approval of reports for October 22, schedule of checks written for the finance committee items. Do I get a second? Second. Mr. Vickers uh, seconds that motion. Um, any more discussion on those items? I'll call for the vote. Mr. Hedon? No. Mr. Vickers? 
Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. And I'll also vote yes. All right, so uh, yes. approval of reports, October 22, 2022, schedule of checks written is passed. I believe all of the other, oh no, no, my bad. We also have discussion for approval of general contract, approval of award for RFQ, 2023-002-HR. I think that was- uh, That was taken oh, off. Oh, that, that was, was right. taken off. So, I yeah. agree, I'm sorry. Somebody said they had that conversation. Thank you. That was Mr. Smith, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry about that. Then I believe we're done. Uh, oh. We're at item 19 for approval of board member request for topics <coughs> of upcoming board work sessions and or board meetings. I already have made a note of the, uh, to put on uh, Mrs. Jackie Stalen and to talk uh, a little bit more about the goals of, not the goals, the uh, flow chart of organization. Organization. Organizational chart, excuse me, of the superintendent. So that's going to be one item that's been request, requested and approved. Another item? Yes, I also requested that we have an item on there to suspend board policy 2.9 and approve um, Six. the policy. I believe it was. This is something. Right. Ms. Alretta. Bilingual? Yeah. Presentation. <laughs> Discussion and approval of that, and then uh, reinstate policy 2.9. Okay, so we would have uh, on the agenda agenda the suspension of that policy, and then right after that would be the reinstatement. Okay, so noted and added. Any other items for addition to the next board meeting? And it's going yes. to be upcoming and fast, I believe. Uh, coming in December, we'll cover those meetings, but we have a couple mm -hmm. weeks and then we'll back. Yes, Mr. Hito. Yes, I'd like to have one for, for the next uh, meeting, uh, an item. Uh, I know we, I think we donate half of our salary, which isn't much, for uh, board scholarships. I would like to see if we can have the board have more involvement in that and make sure we can see all of our, uh, the applicants. And I know graduation's in May, so we still have a few months we can work on it. So do you want it up for a discussion for informational and purposes? And an action item, yes. As an action item? Yes. Okay. Can I get the word in? Yeah, you can clarify that one yeah. more time. Make sure what, what are we, what would we be voting on? Uh, don't know yet. I don't know what we'd be voting on. But what I want to do is be able to address that uh, we have involvement and we see all the applicants that apply for these scholarships. So, and I'm not opposed to either. I'm just asking for the verbiage for record keeping. Are we going to be okay. discussing the process that is used now and then implementing a process that allows okay. us the opportunity I to- I understand what you're asking. Just making sure that the board has more involvement, we were able to see all the applicants that are applying for these scholarships. Madam President, members of the board, if I may, I, I think we can, I can make sure that that happens. Okay. Um, we can definitely discuss it, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a, 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 a request that's, that we can That doesn't necessarily require a vote, it's just something yeah. we would direct you to do for so, us? But, okay. Yeah. Okay. But, but I leave it up to the board. All right, yes. Well, if Mr. Mr. Haram thinks it's necessary, we can put the item on the agenda for approval. No, so I would put it on the agenda anyway, so we can discuss the process that's used already. So it would be on the agenda. The only question I have, is it a voting item or is it a discussion item? Um, and if we it's discussion slash vote, we can do it that way too. But I think the verbiage has to be pretty clear as to what we're voting on. Okay, put it on the agenda, it's an action item. We have 30 days to think about this. We don't have to vote that day, we can table it, we can go in a different direction. Go ahead and put it as an action item. Madam President. Go ahead, thank you. My only question is the agenda goes out next week. So I believe to know what you guys want to do. So we're up coming on the Christmas holiday, so we have an upcoming meeting that's probably less than 30 days away, so um, I guess, the verbiage of whether or not it's a vote matters for Do you want hosting. discussion and approval or what would you like? I just need to know. Discussion and approval, what do you want, Mr. Hill? Leave it as an action item. We don't have to take action. We can table it. Uh, we can 
go different directions. Do you guys have it on your radar now? You guys can think about what you guys want to do. That's it. Discussion slash action. The only, you know, my input would be we have to be specific in how we notice what the action is. So if there are some guidance about how to word the action item. I, I, so if I may, I, I would prefer to have it as a discussion action item that, that states discussion and approval of procedures for awarding board scholarships. I'm good. Does that, does that encap encapsulate what you want? Okay. Okay, there you go. Thank you. It will be added. Any other recommendations for the next agenda? <clears throat> okay. At this time, I'll ask that uh, if there is no further uh, requests, um, where am I at on the thing? Okay, announcement of meetings. This brings us to the announcement of meetings as allowed by the Opens Meeting Act and the direct open meetings resolution on occasion. A quorum of the board members attend the same function, including those held at the school sites, uh, at the district level, as well as sports functions, conferences, workshops, and trainings. Board members will refrain from discussing and or acting on Los Angeles Board Education issues at those settings. In addition, only official meetings are published and other meetings are scheduled. They will be announced in accordance with the Opens Meeting Act. With that being said, I would like to announce the following meetings at this time. December 1st through the 3rd, New Mexico School Board Association Annual Convention at the Embassy Suites Hotel in Albuquerque. A quorum will be in attendance at that conference convention. On December 6, 2022, a Finance Committee meeting will meet here in Central Office Boardroom at 3 p.m. On December 13th, the closed executive session will happen here at the uh, Central Office Boardroom at 4 p.m. to discuss limited personnel issues, specifically the superintendent's evaluation. And this is pursuant to Section 1015-1H2 of the New Mexico State Annals. December 13th, we'll uh, go into our regular board meeting here at Central Office at 6 p.m. Before I call for a motion to adjourn, I will ask that all board members please uh, remain at the meeting a couple of minutes after. We do have signatures requiring all board member signatures. Uh, we also need to make sure that we have our flash drives uh, stay behind uh, here at the superintendent's office. With that being said, we have the, can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'll stand for the motion. I motion to adjourn. So Mr. Bennett motions to adjourn. Can I get a second? Second. Mr. Hedon will second. I do need to um, call for the vote. Mr. Hedon, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yep. Mr. Vickers? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. And I also vote yes. She said she had to have the, she said she had to have the, the minutes done before we sign, right? No. So what we've agreed I don't know. I, 